If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> 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 I think the psychedelics are you know, super placebo because they only work on what's there. They work on your mind and your body and you know, seem to make a, a connection uh, behind the scenes. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grand America Show. First episode of 2020, first episode of the decade, first episode of the year. We're going to be talking to Rick Strassman a little bit later, getting to the DMT stories. We've got Celia here to join us for the intro, friend of the show, Graham C. Setti friend. Um, I don't know if Graham C. Setti in anymore, but of course we got Graham for the show, first show of the decade. Graham Beanie wearing Dunlop. How's it going, buddy? Good, good. Welcome to 2020 Vision, I the year of vision. I haven't gone to a toolkit this year. Yeah. Oh, I just put on today because I just was lazy. At the end of the holidays, you know, got to work tomorrow. I still got four more days. Nice. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So how was your Christmas? It was good. Yeah. You good. went away? Lots of family time, yeah, in Vancouver. Rainy, cloudy. No that. snow, was though? Good. No snow. Above zero? Yep. Ten. That was good. Played my sister's VR game quite a bit. Pistol Whip from Cloudhead Games and uh, played the whole Star Wars uh, thing. And So I did spend a lot of time in virtual reality. I was also... <clears throat> playing virtual reality on Saturday night. Were you? Yeah. I got that place over at the Deerfoot Mall. Oh, yeah. Oh, they really yeah. redid that area there. Looks yeah. a lot better than it did the last time I was in there. Oh, there's a VR arcade there? No, it's just, well, that's where that iFly was, so I seen that thing. Yeah. Was that you who was trying to invite me to something yeah. there not too long ago? What yeah. happened with that? Fell through, or did you go? No, I didn't go. Looks fun. Anyway, yeah, it looks fun. Right next to there is the rec room. Which was like, basically, it's like the Cineplex thing. The arcade from the cinema in this building that serves alcohol. And then they have like a couple pool tables, yeah. a shuffleboard table, some pinball machines. And they had VR set up. There, and too. they had a little VR corner. What'd you back. play? Some Western one. They didn't have Pistol Whip, did you see? No, nah, I think they had like four games. Were you on the from. Oculus? No? You don't know. I sure. think it, I don't know what, no, I don't know. It was a big fucking honking thing. The vibe, strapped maybe? Strapped your head. The vibe, yeah. And then there was these things that went over your ears, but it was so loud in that place, it was pretty hard to, like, concentrate on anything. And then you're, like, in this room with, you know, this Do they have table board. tennis there? They get, like, a very, the VR game? No, 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 like, real table tennis. They have ping, ping pong? Ping pong? Yeah, they had two ping pong really? tables. Yep. Yeah. You know, I'm a hell of a ping pong player. No, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll kick your ass. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. Are you a pong player? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how have we gone seven years without figuring this out? We should get a ping pong table in this motherfucker. <laughs> we could just fold it up and put it in the side. I think there's enough room to play ping pong in the lobby if we clear all that stuff up. There's no room in my house. I don't think I'm I'm into having a table. Just we'll go every once in a while. There's another place in the town that has a, there's the another t- pub that in the town. <laughs> <laughs> there's another pub that has a table too. Uh I used to have one. Yeah, me one. too. Yeah, I used to have one. Outdoor as a kid. One. We used to have them as kids. Yeah. I had one like maybe twelve years ago. It was out back of my place. Of course. It was great till it started raining. Yeah. And just slowly deteriorated. It was good yeah. for one season. Yeah. Yeah. You ever play ping pong? Celia? Yeah, I played ping pong the other day, actually. At, really? Uh, yeah, Vivo up in the northeast there. With oh, my yeah. Kid. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, cool. Ping pong. That's where I play hockey. Oh, yeah. 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 Nice. Awesome. My kids wouldn't have fun playing against me. I would just destroy them. <laughs> Maybe so I'd take it easy on them a bit, but I find it hard taking it easy on them. Oh, yeah. It's hard. It's with that like, little ball, it, oh, it doesn't yeah. hurt. Like, well, it hurts it. a little bit, yeah. That's the first thing, you know, when I go on out of town, that's my favorite thing to do. When you like, because all the resorts always have a couple ping pong tables and you're in like Mexico or Cuba or something like that. They always got a bunch of ping pong tables. I just love hammering down on the ping pong. Yeah. You know who else is a big ping pong player is Scoob. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah of course. Also VR. 
VR. Yep. I just can't get into it. Yeah. Honestly, I tried the VR thing once, and I was off to do other things. Because <clears throat> it's just not my cup of tea. You see that little bruise on my from VR? Nose? That's from that's from hitting the couch with my face. Fell fell over? I, no, I was so I was reaching for something. I was like trying to pistol whip somebody and just smack right in the couch. So you fell over? Mike was playing too. At my, were you he hit the tree. On the couch he he hit the Christmas standing? tree. No, standing. I mean, you're dodging bullets. Like I was sweating. So my legs were sore. My trash in the sore. place like yeah. a couple oh, of Christmas yeah. drunks. Oh, yeah, it was brutal. <laughs> he went right through the Christmas tree. I Took think my sister got a video of it and everything. Yeah. A video of you? No, of him. Oh, yeah. I was gonna say if she does video of you, we need it for the YouTube channel. The game is incredible. It's like it's a shooter, but so it's a bit you know. I know you're anti-gun. Yeah, not really, but it was fun. It was fun to be in there. Well, we should get one of those for the studio. Nah. No. So, Celia, what does it feel like to be on the podcast? We've it's known each other for a few years now. Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. It's so great to be right, right in the studio and see all your little doodads all over the wall and yeah, stuff. Yeah, we got a, quite the collection going on here. Maybe I should introduce Celia. Probably should, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you are I'm just writing all these things down like you've got a lot going on. There are a lot of things author happening right of, now. Author of the CE5 book that I narrated, which is on your YouTube channel, How to See a UFO. Are yes, you still thank off? You, are you still off of CSETI? Well, I'm not really I'm off. Just, we haven't, it's the fuck winter right now. But I mean, I'm a little bit, we'll talk about it a little bit. You could be CSETI now. Have you been out CSETI in lately? No, actually. Um, I've kind of delegated some of the C5 leadership down to um, some of my leaders so that they'll take out people instead because I'm just trying Which to focus. Was, I, was, I did that a couple practice? times. I did that a couple times. Well, we, yeah. Yeah. Well, she's got a channel development group now happening. And uh, she also got the inside scoop on Fire the Grid too. Grant's and you're a clinical away. counselor, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's right. Very good. Huh. So what? Where are you going to go? Go where? C5 and again. Yeah, I'll go again, but I'm just not quite as into it. I had a, an experience on a show with, I don't know, I just, I'm a little suspect of the whole ET thing lately. A Tell little me bit about more. It. Yeah. Well, he was probably hoping I wasn't going to bring it up. <laughs> right right away, he brings it up. Like, you just put me I right on the spot, right? Yeah. I like I prefer under the bus. Well, I mean, we've had these experiences where we go out. I mean, you and I have been together on many of them where we just have these, you know, these sightings and these experiences. And they're not just sightings. Sometimes there are other experiences as well. And so something's making contact with us. And something's also making contact with other people and, and they're keeping this planet like in a prison in a way. So I'm having a hard time reconciling the, the, the evil might not be the right word, but the negative entities that are controlling things compared to like, right. the ones that I would say we're making contact with, which aren't. And then is it smart to make contact? I mean, you know, it's, it's a, it's a tricky, tricky thing. So I, I feel like there's, Something's holding us back as well. So, so how would you? And that's such a key question, right? Because you do need to really develop your own sense of discernment yeah. for everything, but especially C five work. So and channeling, for example. Yeah, exactly. So how would you? How would you make a decision about what was high frequency or like elevated consciousness or like an evolved being versus not? I can't. I mean, how do I? I can't. I, I'm not very. I don't think I'm very tuned into that. Okay. I try. I mean, you know, I meditate. You get too excited. Meditate every day and all. Too excited. And my. It's not so much for me discerning whether it's. The, that's not really the. That's one of the questions. The 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 other question is why. Why is one group or one not group one, aspect of the phenomena, allowed to do what it's doing, like why disclosure. And the secrecy part of it is obviously also in part controlled by an ET aspect or an aspect of ET. And then there's a there's an opened communication that's happening from the other aspect. So why does the open one allow like why is it still allowed to be controlled, the secrecy be controlled? That's the oh, okay. that's kind of and the And where are you getting that that's an ET connection, that there's some kind of like that's just part of my my belief system is okay. that is that it, it's it's the con the the contact has also been made at at you know higher levels than us like government levels and okay. and that kind of thing. Okay, but do they have 
So I guess my question is, who is suppressing the information? Is it ETs or is it humans? It's both. Humans? It's both, yeah, okay. I think. Okay. All of the above? Yeah. Okay. I think Michael's I don't just really a know. low talker. I don't really know. Yeah, you're doing very well in the mic. Excellent. <laughs> I don't really know the answer. I just, I just, it's just a, it just, it's something I'm thinking about more lately. Totally. You know, is why, why, why is this, this allowed? Like, it, and as you should, right? Because you cannot put your skepticism to the side. You need to fully engage it and yeah. work with it to move forward. So, yeah. yeah, highly encourage that. Sorry to spring this on you. Right? <laughs> yeah, this <laughs> is like his. It's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. yeah, good C5 talk. Yeah. So, do you want to get into the inside your inside scoop on Fire the Grid too, and maybe what that's all about? Yeah, and then sure. We can get into some of your other stuff. Okay, absolutely. So, um, do you guys remember that? Were you a part of that? Did you hear about Fire the Grid when it happened back in two thousand seven, two thousand nine, and two thousand eleven? Two thousand seven, nine, and eleven. No, I don't think so. But I know of it from you because I met Shelley, who yes. was who 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 was responsible for that, I guess, back then. Did you ever hear about Fire the Grid, Darren? No. Okay. Okay. So. So I, I'll go through it chronologically, I guess, um, because I like to tell the story that way. Shelly Samoya, Shelly Yates is her now name, but uh, previously Shelly Yates was a very troubled um, person. She was very depressed. Um, her abuse of all kinds oh, yeah, started at age yeah, five. Right. Um, and I'm not revealing anything here because I'm kind of just sharing the story that she's already told, uh, which you can look up on YouTube if you look up Shelly Yates Vancouver speech which I highly recommend because she is so she is such an engaging speaker um, she she had so let's see so she lives in Halifax so she's a Canadian and one day she was driving down the road with her four-year-old son and her car zipped up uh, one of those things on the side like a barricade thing and flipped end over end and landed upside down onto what ended up being a lake and she drowned that day and had a near-death experience. And the way she tells it, it's just gripping. And, you know, you, you, uh, like you're laughing, you're crying. She's such an engaging speaker. And while she was there, she, while she was on the other side, she met um, what she calls extraterrestrials or light beings. She describes them as very tall and white with very long fingers and wearing robes. She's not sure if they were just showing her these images because it was symbolic for her that she could understand it or if that's who they really were. Um, but anyways, while she was on the other side, they gave her instructions on how to save her little boy's life. So he's four years so, old. So because he was in the car at the time. He was in the and car he with was, her. He drowned as well or yep. almost. He did. Yep. Yeah, he he did. was under, I think, I think she was under for 20 minutes and he was under for 30. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she, in her last dying Under moments, as in dead. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you like under the water. Oh, under the water. Under the water for that long. Okay. Yeah. So while she was, so she drowned and let herself go and heard all of this information and she was rescued by a group of people. And when they resuscitated her and she like sat up on the, on the edge of this lake, uh, she screamed out, my baby's in the lake. And they all went, they just went running to like to go and grab him. And he went to a different hospital. He went to the children's hospital and she went to the adult hospital in Halifax. And when she was able to finally run over to see him, the doctors had said, I'm sorry, Shelley, but your son is basically a vegetable and we recommend that you unplug him. And she went out into the hallway. So he was in a, in a, like a coma from drowning? Yeah. So she went out into the hallway and she um, was just, I guess, like impacted by this information. And she all of a sudden remembered that while she was dead, that she had this conversation and interaction with these beings and that they gave her a like full set of instructions for how to save his life. So in front of her, ever since that near death experience, she, she could basically see things, feel things, have these like superpowers. So basically she's standing in the hallway of the hospital and she sees- Which is a common thing after NDEs. Right? Yeah, yeah, several, yeah. Many other people, players like that. She sees in front of her an empty bucket, like an old wooden bucket. And at the bottom of the bucket is a little blob of silvery goo energy stuff. And so she hears, fill it up. 
fill up the bucket. And she looks around her and all the people walking around her in the hospital have kind of this silvery, sheeny like energy all around them, like their auras. And she's like, that's right. I have to go and fill up the, the um, energy body of my son because he is, his energy is depleted. So what she did was she ran to her little black book. She called everybody in her black book, including guys she's only been on dates with like once. She said, come to the hospital, bring anybody you know that can help. I need you to do an energy transfer for my son. And for three days, people would put both of their hands on him and they would tell him all about what is so good about life. You need to stay you're gonna come. You're gonna come back and get a puppy. We, we got to go get some ice cream. Um, there's all these things that you need to come and experience. So basically, as they're speaking and they're speaking about the joys of life, they're raising their frequency. And because we have portals in our hands, that energy gets transferred to other people. So it's been three days in the hospital. The room is beginning to smell, and the doctors are like, "Lady, she's he's dying. You got to unplug him." And she goes into the hallway and she's angry and she says out loud or maybe in her head, I'm not sure. She says, I've done everything that I'm supposed to do. Where is my son? What, what's happening? And she hears a voice from the hospital room. Uh, Shelly, come quick. It's one of her girlfriends sitting with her son. She walks into the room. He's sitting straight up. He's looking at her. Uh, there's a doctor in the room and he's like, oh, like he's, he's just a vegetable. He doesn't recognize you. She... Um, she walks over to him. The room smells like brand new baby. So that smell of death or rotting or whatever it was is gone. She says to him, hey, honey, um, do you know who I am? And he nods his head because he's like just filled with tubes. He can't speak. He nods his head. And the doctor says, oh, that's just a reflex. And she says, is my name Samantha? And he shakes his head no. Is my name Nancy? And he's like, Mom, what are you talking about? Is my name Shelly? He nods his head. And so she says to the doctors, don't even talk to me anymore. And <laughs> within, within just a few days, he was up and out of the hospital. So that was a complete miracle. Eight neuroscientists, top neuroscientists from maybe all over Canada. I'm not sure where they are from. They came and they like reviewed the case and they're like, we don't know what we did. But we're trying to figure it out because this is amazing. And um, she tried to talk to them. They were totally not interested in what she had to say about what she did. So Shelly's living a great life with her son. She's so happy that he's with her. Um, and she's she starts to hear the beings. She's in the bathtub. She starts hearing the beings and they start telling her what you did for your dying son, you can do for a dying planet. And she's like, no, thanks. I don't want this. I don't want a project. I don't want, I don't want to have anything to do with this. I've got my son. Thank you. That's great. Now move along. The hero's journey. Right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. The reluctant hero. Yeah. She was very reluctant. She met Dr. Greer. She went on a, like a, a, um, traveling tour trying to figure out what had happened to her and what she could do and how she could offload this project. And she said, to Greer, I've got a project for you. He's like, no, thank you. <laughs> but Dr. Greer knew Annie Tremblay, who's also known as Aniel, the singer Aniel. And Annie had had a vision previously where an angel came to her and said, you are going to work on a project with a woman um, who's had a near-death experience and you're going to bring her message to the world. So Annie haunted Shelley for a long time and tried to get her to convince her to work on this project and basically do Fire the Grid, which is um, like this mass meditation that the beings gave her instructions to do. And Shelly finally got um, her arm twisted into doing it because Annie called her one day and said, um, you owe a debt of gratitude because you hold your son in your arms every day. So Shelly said, fine. She wouldn't do it for inspiration or for purpose or mission, but she would she could do it because of guilt. So she decided wow. to she decided to do that. She went all over the world and she uh, spoke and and because she's such an engaging speaker and because she's such a human person, she's really down to earth. Um, she's a very she's a very good storyteller and she's just kind of like every person, like every man, every woman. And so she engaged a huge, massive group of people. So the first three months that their website was at, up, they had 40 million full reads each month. So, and a full read, they're considering like a 70% or I think 80% like of the site that is viewed. 
and in and in total totality, they think that they reached about seventy to a hundred million people. And is this when she was on George Norrie's show then too? Yeah. So George Norrie interviewed her and um, yeah, she basically went viral. And, millions, and this was back in so 2007? 7, 9, and 11. So I don't know which numbers ascribe to which years, yeah. but I think the total is 100 million. Yeah. Wow. So she basically got together a, like millions of people in a mass meditation. Um, and then how long, like, can you talk a bit, a bit about the meditation? Yeah. So the... The reason why the meditation was so key to do at that time, around that 2012 time, right, is because things were kind of setting like jello in the world. So if you can imagine like a big bowl of jello and it's in the process of setting and you lobbed an egg into that bowl, then the the key was to try and see how far you could get that egg into that bowl before the jello set. So that's kind of what was happening is that the beings were trying to help humanity to set ourselves on a better course than what we were headed towards. So by firing the grid, we basically put our hands up as participants in a different world than than what was maybe like the course that it was going on and um, and literally cr- lifted the energy field of the earth. Princeton University did um, some kind of a study on mm-hmm. the energy field, and I'm not yep. sure if this is the Schumann resonance or what it is that they were measuring, but there was a measurable difference between what was happening before um, Fire of the Grid happened and then like the the time after the meditations. Wow. I might have remembered something about that. I wonder if the con- that consciousness project, there was a global consciousness project. I wonder if That's they were involved in that. Yeah. I was trying to look at it today to see if I could make sense of it. I'm not really technical scientific person so but it was that yeah there's G- no GCP. chance i was picking that shit up in 2007 <laughs> what, no chance what there's were you no... doing in 2007 oh a little this little that a lot of partying um there's like no there was i can't even envision a conduit for that information to have gotten to me like you know there's no way it would have been on mainstream you know i was a lot of tv and sports then no podcasts Unless it was on like Facebook. I don't think any of my friends would have been sharing it at that time. If I was a different human being 12 years ago. That what was about a you? long time ago. Yeah, man. You were always kind of like in and out of it back then though. You were yeah. sort of like, because I mean, you've been part of MUFON. I was in the podcasting since... back in 2008, 2007, but and I got sober in, in 90s. sober in March 2008. So I was probably in two, at the first oh, fire of the grid. The when was it? it? Seven? 2007, right what in month? The thick of it. January. January. Yeah, I'm I was in, in the I thick of it. January. Yeah, I was January. in the thick of it then. So. Zero chance. Yeah. Huh. That's too bad. When's the next one? Okay, so um, so the next one is January, I think, the 13th. Is this the second one? This is the so second one. This is one. Fire the Grid so 2. The grid so they just waited. Coming. Like, well, and well, here's 15, 14, 16, 13, 13 years. 11, 11, 11 12. It's 13. Nine, nine. It's 13. No, the oh, last one was 2011. One, the last yeah. one was 2011. So oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, here, here's the interesting. So how is this the second one then? Because it was a stage four. of three, right? It was, it's like the. Yeah, it's like a set of three. So event one, two, and three back then. Like and a then event best one, of three? Two, three. <laughs> like the yeah. Star Wars trilogy. Yeah. No, oh, so it gets worse every time. <laughs> So here, so here's kind of the interesting thing about me sitting here and chatting with you guys about it is that um, the reason why there was such a lag between the fire the grid the last time and now um, is because Shelley's has had a really difficult time coming forward, and she doesn't make it a secret that she's had a ton of trauma, and um, trauma really affects people in uh, a lot of different ways, and it's not it's not being been she hasn't been able to keep herself stable enough to be a public figure. That's pretty stressful to be a public figure. I mean, I know. Oh, yeah. We don't. I mean, yeah. Like when you guys started the podcast, was it stressful at all? um, No. No, but it was such a slow start, right? We we didn't have any listeners at the beginning. It was very slow. right? I mean, it was. And we didn't want to be public figures. So we totally understand. I mean, we don't even really like being on YouTube. We're not on YouTube right now. Not right now. but. You know, like it's a different thing getting the whole video stuff and all. Like we just want to talk about interesting things, right? So I could understand. I I wouldn't want to be the face of of anything like that. You're gonna yeah. be the face you of know. you're the face of the cult. 
You know what I mean? So <clears throat> I met Shelly when she came out to see you when you helped her through that yeah. time. And, and we were going to have her on the show and all that because it was very in- interesting and engaging. So I'm glad to talk to you about it now. Yeah, that is a funny mini story in itself in that I had contacted her because I've been waiting for her book. Shelly's gone through a lot of flack for not being able to kind of um, come forth and continue being this like basically helper or healer for humanity um, or for the group of people that particularly resonate for her. And um, and so, so oh, I just sort of lost my train of thought. So, so basically... Yeah, I was going to say that like even David Wilcock had said um, somebody was kind of dissing Shelley and saying something about how, oh, well, you know, she's not around anymore or how come she's disappeared or whatever. And David Wilcock had said something like, well, aren't you glad that she did what she did? Because where would we be otherwise? Oh, and something else about just returning to your original comment at the beginning of the show about discernment. Shelley has some has had doubts about, you know, like, am I doing what is best for everyone? Am I hearing this information from benevolent beings? Like, what is the real deal here? And she she had doubts right up until um, Emoto, Dr. Emoto. Yeah. He did a water crystal on Fire the Grid. And he wow, said it was one really? of the most beautiful crystals he's ever seen. Wow. Ooh, I want to see That's that. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, I got it right here. See the guy from, uh, he's the guy from What the Bleep Do We Know? Don't we? That, that, you know. That's the movie that sort of broke through because I, that would have been probably around, I don't know when that shit came out, must have been 2006, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. Yeah, my sister dragged me to see it in the but theater. I, oh, that's beautiful. Oh, that is, wow. Looks like, a, looks like an individual snowflake. Jeez, that looks like the um, the mask I've been wearing recently. The uh, we, we bought these masks for Christmas. You're wearing masks? For what sort of mask? When do you wear it? <laughs> Meditation. The meditation mask. Yeah. I thought it was a sex yeah, mask. No. <laughs> uh, it's not that out there, trust me. <laughs> I'm trying to remember the crystal now that it's uh, it's full of these crystals that are in that shape around your eyes. Oh, okay. What does it do? It, it just helps you. It's it, like a printed pattern. It's uh, It helps with the all the infrared rays and stuff like that okay. and yeah cool. really interesting interesting helps in meditation too anyway i think i rented you can feel it. the thing pulsing yeah Ooh, it's really awesome i don't know why i rented it but i think i rented it i remember watching it and that shit blew my mind i was yeah. like is this real is this a movie is this like yeah. a documentary what's going on because this shit seems crazy yeah. i mean i didn't actually really get down the rabbit hole for another half a decade or so but who would have known you would have talked to some of the people from that movie did I? Yeah, you have. Which ones? Stuart Hammerhoff. Hammerhoff. Yeah, that's right. And huh. uh, wasn't uh, Lynn McTaggart in it? Yeah, was that's right. Too? Yeah. Was yeah. she? I don't know. You if know, she was. I watched I Am again not too long ago. There's a few people from there I wouldn't mind tracking down, like Desmond yeah. Tutu and guys like that. Tough to get a hold of, though. They're never on Twitter. I go to Desmond Tutu's no, Twitter page. He hasn't been on Twitter in like fucking no, six years. No, because they know how toxic it is. Oh, this is a problem. I mean, I don't even like going on Twitter. It's a terrible place. Is it bad? Yeah, yeah. Have you know? I see you're on there once in a while. I'm on Twitter, but I don't know what to do with it. So, so this is good. Just okay, just keep, leave it. Just, just leave it that just way. Just stay the course. Okay. It's when when you start following a bunch of fucking people who all think they know what's up, and I we follow like twenty five thousand people because we were following everyone back and we were following other people and now we follow twenty five thousand people and fucking twenty thousand of them are fucking little bit out there most of the time they're constantly <laughs> fighting with someone about something oh man they're not out there in a good way usually politics it's almost like i can't you can't i swear i can't go through if i go through 100 tweets if i open twitter right now and i go through the first 100 tweets that pop up in my timeline 90 of them will be about politics i would bet let's see we got uh the first two are not well, it seems like we've got a lot of 2019 and review <laughs> tweets right now. Yeah. It's like all, uh, all, it's all 2019 stuff. They took the day off, but it'll be back to politics tomorrow. Graham, what was your catalyst book or movie or whatever to get into all this stuff? Uh, what the Bleep was definitely that was up there. That was one of yours yeah. too? Yeah. The four, sure the no, four, well, I gave I Ancient mean, Aliens credit because I watched What the Bleep do and then I just kept doing what I was doing and forgot all about it for like five or six years. 
and then I remember watching Ancient Aliens and starting the podcast, and that's when you start remembering that movie. But I kind of watched it, you know. I wasn't in the space to really, I didn't know what to do with that. You know, I didn't have a, a <laughs> shelf to put that on, so I just tucked it away until I did. Before I got sober, it was the I watched The Secret, and I was uh, reading The New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. And uh, that that sort of helped me get through that whole time. But before that, I mean, it was the UFO sighting in the early 90s and right. all that stuff. I mean, I was into a lot of that stuff before things got bad, you know. But That's what um, Shelly was for me. She was one of those really, like, pillars of um, faith for me. And anytime I would have, like, an anxiety attack about, like, what do I think and what is life and is life good and, you know, what am I doing here and all of that kind of stuff, that kind of panic attack stuff, I would have to like reduce myself back to zero and say, okay, what do I believe in? I believe in being kind. Okay, what else do I believe in? I believe in Shelley Yates' story. It's a good story. Yeah, that's the thing. When you get a story like that that's that like based, on it, an, based on a miracle yeah. and an NDE with all the doctors and the whole, the whole like, you know, conflict between Western medicine and this filling the bucket of loving energy, which healed this, this guy, this kid, right? I yeah. mean- that's that's something to fall back on. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So so that's why I kind of trailed Shelly for quite a long time. And I would haunt one of her, well, Annie Tremblay, NAL, the one that had run the organized Fire the Grid. So I had her on Facebook somehow because she's actually part of the C5 network. She does C5 from right. Montreal. Right. Didn't you quit Facebook now? No. You're oh. back? Oh, me? Yeah, I yeah. did quit Facebook. No. You saw that? Yeah, I did. I quit Facebook and I'm not really on there much. That's good. Fuck Facebook. <laughs> I mean, this will be on Facebook eventually, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not on there very much. But um, but I kept bugging Anael and saying, hey, what's Shelly up to? What's going on? And she would reply and say, yeah, she's she's pretty depressed. She's trying to work on her book. She's trying to put things together um, and come back and like bring out some more information. And last year, I reached out to Annie again. So that was probably like the fourth or fifth time that I reached out uh, because I was really excited about Shelly's book that she was writing. And uh I said, why don't you, hey, why I'm a counselor. Why don't you tell Shelly she can have some free counseling if she's feeling depressed and maybe like that might even help her and I'd be happy to do that. She's done a lot for the world. So I get this email one day and it says, hey, it's from Shelly. Hey, never mind the counseling. I had a vision that a dark haired woman was going to help me bring my message to the world. Is that you? And I emailed back and I said, yes. <laughs> and uh, we got into this conversation over text and she booked a flight to come out to Calgary and she came out and that's how you met her. Yeah. How long ago was that? Last year. Last year? Yeah, last August. What? Yeah, last August. Last year, yeah, so a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, yeah, Yeah. exactly. Yeah, sorry, not last August, previous. Yeah. Yeah, and so she tried. She did pretty good. She was excited. Um, She did a little talk. You were there. You saw her speaking. What did you think of her talk? Yeah, it was pretty incredible, yeah. A couple of points I remembered. I mean, I took some notes. I could look back in the notes. I should have had them ready. But I remember her talking about meditation and how a lot of people try and clear their mind. And she was recommending the opposite. Like, listen to what comes in, right? Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, to hear the pay messages. Pay attention to the messages. Yep, yep. Instead of just trying to clear it all away. Like, if you clear it all away, then what's there? So. Yep, totally. Yep. And then discern them too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh so she, she bailed that time. So it was probably about four or five days and she tried and we did get some videos for her. We got some information, um, set up a whole bunch of all that social media stuff. And her intention at the time was to reach out to 15 to 25 year olds because these are the core change agents that are anchored in place and waiting for directions to move forward with kind of like the next what phase. What age, sorry? 15 to 25. Oh, it makes sense. I mean, yeah. that's that's where the change is going to happen. Is I would the young shoot younger than that. I feel like the 15 to 25 generation is lost. No, I shouldn't say that. I mean, we got a ton of listeners in the 20 to 25 range. Maybe, you know, that might be the sweet spot. Maybe it's the, like 15 years after that that are fucked. But I don't know. I wonder what the average age of an Antifa cell is. Of a what? An Antifa cell. Oh, I don't know. What are we calling them cells yet? An Antifa, like the Antifa people with the masks and the bats and the... Wow, I totally, I don't know that, what that is. Oh, you're That's s- good. I'm out you're of it. Blessed. I'm out of the loop. That's a good place to be. I've been trying to actively remove myself from the loop for a while. 
But Graham keeps fucking dragging me back in. Generation Z. 96. Generation Z? Born between 96 and 2010. So that would be. No, that's like. So that's like. That'd uh, be 19. No, nine. That'd, oh, yeah. No, that's that'd like be. Nine to. Yeah. It'd yeah. Be, yeah. It'd be Generation Z. It Generation Z? Yeah. Z? Yeah. So yeah. after the millennials. I'm a millennial. Okay. I'm an I'm a X. Well, you're on the cusp, aren't you? I'm like the. Fr- I could be the first millennial ever. It was like they say it's early 1981, and I was I was born in March 1981, March 10th. Could be could be the first I, one, I'm probably in the first couple thousand. Cool. I don't know how many babies are born today. It's four million a year in the U.S. So that's like, or maybe I'm in the first million. We'll call it the first million. Okay, we'll be Gen X, right, Graham? I'm I'm X. Yep. Yep. Me yep. too. Yeah, Z start or the first millennial batch starts like. Early 81, and I think the next batch is like 87 or something like that. Don't say batch. That sounds like we're in the Matrix or something. We probably are. Yeah, it's yeah. possible. It's probably very similar to the Matrix with less computers. Yeah. It's crystalline. So, okay. Can I play a jingle? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> we had the new moon, dark sky, which is great. <laughs> Had a plan camping, pitched a tent, went back there for the night. Crystal clear. Darkest have you heard this yet? So I have heard this many times. Okay, that shit right. starts right. happening. Pow, pow, pow. <laughs> we started seeing flash bulbs. Okay. He always tries to get me to shut it, it off down. before he says his name. Yeah. Yeah. Is, <laughs> okay. Yeah. He said he'd start. So what is your guys' audience he, like? He will he never fucking forgive himself <clears throat> for saying his full name. Oh. Anyway. Is it 20 to 25, your audience range? or? Oh, our audience range is probably like, well, my little nephew, nephew listens, and he's like 15. So it starts at around 15 and tops out at like 65. Okay, you guys are just, you got everybody. But yeah. I think we're like probably the biggest. Probably 25 to 45 or something. Uh, yeah, it's like. But I don't know that. This, it seems like a lot of men, I would say it's like. 90% men. 80% men. 90% on YouTube men, but I think that's a YouTube thing. But I think we're probably like 80% men, and we're probably, if I had to guess, I'd say like 70% is probably between 20 and 40. Okay. So it's possible that there are some core change agents like out there listening right now yeah. who might be interested. You should be 18 to be listening to the show. I mean, technically oh, really? we're 18 up, so... Because of Explicit, all the swearing. Yeah. yeah. All the swearing. This guy fucking swearing all the time. So uh, so let's talk about the change agents then. Okay. So 15 to 25. Yeah, 15 yeah to 25. Shelley thinks that. And they're out there and they're waiting for information. And particularly, I don't know if it's particularly her information or not. I mean, this stuff is out there, right? There's other grid workers. There's other people sharing stuff that is very similar to Shelley's message, right? Shelley's message is that it, to play in the new field in the new earth that think that is coming, that we need to be high frequency. And then if you're not high frequency, then you may have something like um, frequency illness where your body is just not uh, adjusted to the new energies that are happening. Um, to be high frequency is really simple. Uh, you just basically... Okay, I need to explain the grid, I guess. So there's a grid of hexagons and it doesn't surround the earth. I used to think that it surrounded it's the earth. It's a hexagon now. Yeah, that is a hexagon, this, the Emoto water crystal. Yeah. yeah. But the, it's actually between us. So between us, there is a grid of hexagons. And everybody on the planet has one hexagon. And inside that hexagon, it's like a frosted straw, like a frosted glass clear straw. It's like straw. my personal space. Hexagon. It's like your personal space, I guess so. Except, well, there's a, one photon of light, which is like your truth. And, and it goes around the hexagon because we're vibrational and so it spins. So right, right now are our hexagons jammed up against each other. Or is, can there be a space between the hexagons? Or are they be, always are they always touching? They're always touching, and they're at junctions. But so you're, if you're out in the middle of nowhere, your hexagon just gets bigger to keep touching the people that are farther away. Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's a. That's a good question, Darren. I don't know, but Shelley says that like your hexagon could be on the other side of the world, like above Peru, and Graham's could be above Tibet. Huh. So you could be in the same room together, but your hexagons may be totally different. My hexagon might not even be here. Not even here. 
That explains a lot. But huh. when, but when, so when you're feeling down, angry, resentful, guilt, your this light inside of the tube is just going wom wom. That's when your hexagon's whomp. gone. Your hexagon is there wherever it is attached to the grid of all of humanity. Oh, so it's like your matrix pod. I guess so. Yeah. But then when you're feeling really good and you can raise your frequency and you're feeling happiness, joy, bliss, whatever it is, then your your little light inside is going wing, 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 wing. Then does your hex going get closer or does it just stay where it was? Is just, it like stationary? It's there all the time? So it's, it's very, can I say it's like the matrix pod? Yes. It never moves. You were born it there never and moves. it never moves. Yes. It's okay. your matrix pod. Yeah. But when you're, when you are living in joy, you actually flood other people's hexagons. So you could charge up to like a thousand other hexagons around. Now is that you. just going to charge their hexagon or is that going to transmit to their person? Uh, well, I guess a hexagon and a person is kind of the same thing. So that's like the web that comes out of you when you're in dreamland, the web that's connecting you to everything. If it gets cut, you die. That's connected to your hexagon, maybe? Maybe. Oh, huh, I like that. Yep. So so her, part of her message what, to people was to how to get their hexagon to go wing, 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 wing. And she had uh, some instructions from the beings. Of course, there's a hundred thousand different ways of like raising your frequency and feeling better. But they said that uh, that you listen to music. Say thank you. Find your human joy. Do it without Gratitude. judgment, without self judgment, and say thank you, and do random acts of kindness. So mm. those three things. Mm. How random? Uh, Can they be like premeditated randomness? Oh, how random are the acts of kindness? <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that that meant random towards the person. Like you just pick a person you don't really know, so it's random person in your life that pops up. But it oh. could be premeditated. If it's premeditated, is it still random? Second degree kindness. <laughs> yeah. First degree is when you're doing it for something because they were kind to you. Right. So you you're paying get, them back. Get them back. Yeah. You stew on it. That's first degree kindness. Right. Because you can't accept it. So yet. this is like third degree kindness, just the heat of passion. This happened. <laughs> totally. So the, the kindness kind. thing is actually opposite of murder. <laughs> <laughs> I like that logic. <laughs> Um, another thing that Shelley shares from the beings are the principles of being high frequency. So number one, do no harm. Number two, do everything you do with honesty, integrity, and three, find, find your human joy, live it without judgment and say, thank you. So that one is the same. Hmm. So the judgment thing is hard. That's the yeah. hardest one. Yeah. Self judgment and judgment yeah. towards others. Both hard. Yep. I mean, it's almost Both like are. the four agreements in a way. Have you read that? That was yeah, one of the books that really, uh, yeah. Yep, totally. So I'm also going to share with you guys the message for humanity that Shelley got from the beings recently. And I had a little bit of a, me coming into the show is really fun for me because I feel like, like it's a really intimate exchange. We're friends. I've known you for years. Um, I've heard Darren for years. And I feel like I can kind of share this information yeah. without... Uh, kind of crossing over maybe Shelley's boundaries and also thinking about like the message that she has been prompted to share with humanity is for humanity. It's not for Shelley to gain from or, and I don't think that she would particularly want to keep that to herself. However, I'm still, I'm not going to be sharing this information with anyone else. I'm just going to share it with you guys and go do my thing, which is like ET contact work and just let Shelley come out whenever she's going to come out with her information. But, um, but the, the reason why she wanted to come out again was to share that things are happening and going to happen in the world, that things may happen. There's a potential for uh, maybe almost like a parallel universe splitting or something like that. She showed us, Graham, that image, right, of the Earth. Do you remember that thing? Yep. The two Earths. It was like the yep. Earth was going through a mitosis. Yep. And there was like one whole healthy, happy Earth, and there was one Earth that looked like it had gone through like a cataclysm. So these are kind of like potentials that the beings have shared with her that may happen. And she says that it's possible that portals may open and that people could walk through them or like a rainbow bridge, which I think is part of. So people just start disappearing? Possibly. I'd like that one. Of all the like apocalyptic endings, that one would be neat. I mean, it'd be terrible at the time, but I mean, it sounds funner than the others, right? Well, supposedly when... 
Where if do you it, go? If it happens, the pe- these people disappear. The people who are high frequency disappear, and the people behind their memories get wiped up that the people even existed. Mm. So that's really interesting, mm-hmm. right? So like, if I go somewhere, if I get to go somewhere, then who's left behind and how does their story change that I was never even a part of it? That's what maybe the Mandela effect is. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Because the Berensteins evaporated. But they couldn't, they were like, the books are too ingrained. We can't change it. Just change the name. <laughs> so who makes the, who's making those decisions? Is it aliens? I don't think so. Is it? I don't know. What do you think? I don't think that that's happening. But, I mean, because this ties into the C-SETI thing. Do you guys think it ties into that? Is there a crossover between... Fire the Grid and CE5? Yeah. Or? I think there is because Shelly's pretty connected to... So, Anael, Dr. Greer, she's seen James Gilliland. In fact, I kind of think that Shelly, James, and Dr. Greer... And Wilcox in there, too. I mean, it's the whole crew. I mean, it seems like it should all be... Yeah. I mean, th- th- I'll be honest, the whole Greer, I don't, I don't trust them. Well, I, he's a whole topic onto himself. Yeah. Right? Like, but, but think about it and compare Shelly to Greer. Shelly... Shelly believes that she was born here with a mission and that she was predestined to have this near-death experience and to bring this message through, particularly because of her strengths. And Greer's definitely got like a very mission-oriented life. So if both of them were predestined to be here, yeah. Forget about, but forget about how much he charges for a course because that's, just forget it. Well, that, no, but that's what. I'm saying that's what I think he's out for. No, but that's That's my opinion. Just forget about that for a second. I'm allowed to have that. Think about what but he did wait, for the, the disclosure that, movement that, that, was he huge. He might have fucked it up because he might have sidetracked. In 2001. Hulk. It was probably disinformation. Him and Nick Pope. <laughs> oh, my God. So, just listen to this. Like, so, what? It, because that could all be explained by, it makes me think of nonlinear time again. Because if she can see a world that's trashed and a world that's not trashed, that could just be the world at different times. Maybe she could see that her son was going to get better ahead of time. I wonder if that's, it's weird. Hmm. But just get back to Greer and Shelley for a second, because, and I know there's a lot of people that are like frustrated with Greer, but he does, <laughs> Darren's hand went up, but he's done a lot. He was my portal to ET contact. He was my portal out. <laughs> Seriously, I started watching. He's out. done a lot. Yeah, he's, that's he's well, that's what that's lot. why I he's, try and defend him because I don't care how much he charges for. When his he outings. started crying and un- unacknowledged, I've never gone back. I I lost interest in the whole thing at that point, well, and I've never got it back. And there you go, because that grief is just like ego based stuff, right? So he's a he's in like a like dual like being, like all of us. Stuff. Well, maybe, but. We like all have ego. we all have our downsides. Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm yeah. trying to support Greer, but look at the difference between Too Greer and Shelley. So Shelley, she's got like no ego. She's got no interest in being on the public stage. She's she's just such a really humble person, and she is having a real difficult time being that person. So like, was Greer just implanted with this massive narcissistic ego just so that he could um, pull through and like be the tip of the spear for the C five movement? So that's why I'm. I just I don't want to discount Greer for what are some of his human fallibilities. Yeah, that's that's like me too. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I feel the same way. For yeah. Sure. I mean, just the disclosure movement in general. I mean, it was massive in the two that when I when I knew about Greer in that mid mid nineties, early nineties. So what? Ninety three, so ninety four. I'm ignorant. He was he was he was working on the disclosure project, and he brought all so those what people did the disclosure to the Congress. Project? What happened? He brought from all that? the military people, all these all these people to Congress to do this massive disclosure video like days upon days of testimony witness testimony and knowing hundreds what you, of people knowing what you know now about the inner workings of the u.s government do you think that that was all above board uh yeah probably yeah hmm. okay i think so i mean not to say that they they didn't some of the people in there didn't have their own agendas or they were maybe part of the part of the cover-up but that that's it still was was a massive awakening for people or or it was like a massive distraction or sidestep or push away from where it didn't i mean i don't think it was powerful enough to distract anything it didn't i mean i think 9-11 happened uh shortly after that 
So 9-11 was a distraction from that, you could say. Oh, <laughs> not from the shit Rumsfeld said. <laughs> Didn't 9-11 happen after that? I don't remember. I can't remember, but I think it was in the summer of uh, the summer. 9-11 happened in September 2001. Yeah. yeah. No, I meant the, the <laughs> disclosure. disclosure. Oh, okay. so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, it's tough, right? Because once you start getting into your mental body, you kind of lose track of the truth, right? Like the truth is something that you feel. So, and that's where discernment comes, right? Like you just said earlier that you feel like you're not really in touch. You're totally in touch. You're like a loving, caring person. Yeah, but I, but, but it's, it's the, it's the intuition, like the discernment between voices compared to intuition and all that, which is difficult. Oh, well, that's like just another high level kind of like, you could just ignore that too. You just follow your heart and just like whatever. Yeah, but it's even hard. How do you, how do you follow your heart? I mean, that's tough. There was a time when my heart just wanted to do a ton of cocaine. (laughs) (laughs) And maybe you needed to go through that. Honestly. No, I feel like I needed to go through. If that was where your excitement was, then you, then that's what you do. Yeah. True. I mean, if I had a chance to change anything, I probably wouldn't change anything. I, w- I wouldn't either. That. Might tweak a little things here and there. <laughs> but it's hard to know, uh, w- hard to feel what's in your heart. That's what I'm saying. Like, as maybe as a guy as well, it's just hard to to separate out the head from the heart, intuition from your fear based ego decisions or your fear based or your negative self talk compared to intuition like it's hard absolutely you know? that's like practice right like yeah. just getting used to listening yeah. just observing and being yeah. with your heart yeah. yeah most of it's illusion like those you know most of your the self-talk is illusion you know? oh yeah it all just crumbles away into meaningless garbage yeah it's funny it's funny like that was the one of the takeaways from the dmt experience was that like all the stuff you're thinking about just as you're smoking it. You're like, got all this shit going through your head. It's like, <laughs> none of that shit matters, you <laughs> dummy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's funny because sometimes that'll happen. I'll be like scrambling around my house and I'm on, I'm on vacation. I don't got shit to do. Let me guess you're late for something though. No, no, I don't do late. Oh, okay. I'm not, I'm not late for stuff. I'm not an on-time person. It's never going to happen. Didn't he just contradict himself? Yeah. I'm not late for stuff. I'm not an on-time person. Yeah, I'm not late. I'm just not on time. I'm not on your time. I'm on my time. I'm sorry. It's disrespectful to you. It is. <laughs> it is. And other people too. Yeah. You might have to schmooze your way out of all those, but that's okay. That's You're okay. schmoozing. I'm, I'm a planner. So. Exactly. I'm not an on-time person. <laughs> there's two types of people in the world. There's on-time people, and then there's the rest of us. So... Or no, there's actually, it's the opposite. It's like most of the people are on time and then there's the rest of it. You think so? Yeah. Huh. Well, good. I'm in the minority. (laughs) So where were you going that? So anyway, I'll be scrambling about all this shit. I got to do the dishes. I got to, you know, all this menial fucking shit. And I'm on holidays. I don't really have anything to do but hang out with my kids and have a good time. And I can get that same sort of break where I've got all this shit's in my head and I'll go around the corner towards the bathroom and it all just sort of like... I can get that sense of meaningless of it all. And it, it's very similar to, I, it reminds me of that feeling of going into the DMT room. Oh, yeah. Just yeah, like, yeah. where I was yeah. like, all of a sudden, all that shit is just like, none of that shit matters. Who cares when the dishes get done? Who cares? You know, but, and I, it, I just feel it break away. It's, it's kind of very similar. I think it's good to go to ground zero and just have all of your mental constructs be washed away, which is kind of in a way what you're talking about, Graham, with like CSETI is that you're like, gee, I'm just going to like reevaluate this from zero, which is good. I think you should do that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's what I'm doing. How's the new diet? That's about 12 hours old. Nice. Actually more than that, but yeah, good. So far, so So good. So far, so good. Yeah. I already smoked some weed today. You couldn't even go a week, eh? Like, no. I didn't even go the day. <laughs> are we... Are we? Uh... So that, that mask is a tourmaline mask. It's got oh, the it's tourmaline. tourmaline. Yeah. Why? What do you mean by that? Cool. Well, it's like gems. I thought it was just like a oh, printed yeah, no, material. No, no, no. It's a tourmaline thing. mask. And it says... Uh, it's, I was just the reading Lego here. mask more. I was just reading here about the tourmaline, and it says it's got the same frequency as water. Oh, cool. it's on the same frequency as water. You gotta be careful. The, inf- when you're the far, that mask, the far, impressionable. It, the far infrared energy that terminally naturally emits causes a resonance in the body at the same frequency as water. Hmm. 
you can feel the thing like just pulsing. Like all you do is put on this mask and you can feel this pulsing. Does it have a beak? What? Does it have a beak? No, it's not like that. It's <laughs> just a fucking mask. <laughs> <laughs> Like a Robin, Batman and Robin mask, you know? Okay. Like, looks like that. So can I just wrap up? Yes. Yeah. Let's, let's so basically, that, yeah. like, Fire the Grid 2 it's is happening. It's hard to keep us focused. For <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Shelly called me recently, and she asked me to come out because she was, like, ready again to try to, try to you know, complete her mission, what she believes is her mission. And she did pretty good. She's way more stable. Um, I love her. I don't care if she does this mission or not. Like, I'm definitely friends with her for life. And she wasn't able to move forward with it, which is totally, totally cool. But she did tell Aniel, go ahead and let the humans know that January 13th is Fire the Grid 2. And this year, next year, and the year after that. And so 2022, 24? Yep. 2020. What year is it? So 2021, 20, 22. Oh, 2021. 20, so yeah, it's every year this time. Yeah. Not and every so, two years. Okay. And it's a great opportunity for us to come together and to... Uh, basically flood the junctures. So we've already fired the grid, so we've kind of like awakened the grid of humanity. And now if multiple people come together and meditate at the same time and flood the junctures, then it will be just a really powerful um, energy upliftment. So how do people find out about this? So I would probably go to the Facebook page that Aniel is running and uh, just join join the group. And I think she's going to probably create an event and you can... Should I put a link Attend. in the show notes to the yeah. Facebook page? Or, yeah, okay, sure. I'll put a link in the show notes. Yeah, if you just look up or Fire, search fire, fire in the that Grid too. without a Facebook account. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, she's got the she's got it on Instagram. Actually, she's you can use my Twitter. Facebook account. I made one. Okay. Grim, Erica. I know. I've got that. That's what pops up. <laughs> I wasn't things. using it before, but I reactivated it because it's the only fucking way that I could get the Facebook uh, auto send thing yeah. working again. Yeah. yeah. They tricked me, but I tricked them back. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the main, the main message again is to raise the frequency of people and the earth itself. Like is, yes. is to, yep, and that's in order kind. to heal it, just as if just like her son was healed kind of exactly. thing. Like, so to pump that, that yep. positive energy into the earth to. Yep. Exactly. To heal, it. to heal it from negative energy, pollution, all that stuff, like everything. Or, yeah. Or like, like look what? at the world Global around us right now. Mostly. God. <laughs> it's nuts. Well, it depends on which way you look at. I mean, there's still, there's still a beauty, oh. beauty in the world oh, too, yeah. right? It could be. I thought you were it's very, hold the focus. It's very perception based, right? So Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So for one hour and you just do it 11-11 uh, GMT, which in Calgary means 4-11 in the morning. So one thirteen eleven eleven. I'll be fast asleep as I count. You could set an intention to say that I declare that my soul or that my essence will join this meditation in my sleep. At I'll this write hour. a post it. Do a post I'll leave it. it. I'll leave it on the nightstand. <laughs> but if you're going to be conscious, then you just do whatever raises your frequency. So if that is meditation, then that and that's your bag, then do it. But if it's not something that you're good at or you don't like meditation, then don't do that. You don't do what doesn't bring you joy. What's the thirteenth? Is that a Monday? Yeah, I think it is a Monday. Why would they Tuesday. start on a Monday morning? It's I mean, the a it's an astrological terrible. time, and if you look at other groups oh. around the world, they're also doing group meditations because their beings or guides or whatever are giving them information that this is the window it's of okay, opportunity. I got because it, ma- it makes Monday a big morning. difference. Yeah, yeah. Pick a time. Yeah, the reason why Shelley said that the beings gave a time was because we like to do things in synchronization. We like synchronized mm-hmm. swimming. We like all it. the patterns, right? You don't. Well, have not to only that, but there's power in the patterns too. There's power in the in the. Did you see some of the drone? things from new year's no they had all the drones go over new york and make a giant fucking clock with ticking hands it's crazy the shit they're doing with drones is insane we need a drone <laughs> wow no, i didn't see that michael's gonna get one he's gonna let's borrow it Ugh, i don't care about drones you will when i have, when I have some sweet cack footage of you <laughs> so so I should say we do have, sorry, are we yeah, we're, wrapped up? Well, we're I, mean, I mean, I guess I do have some housekeeping to get to. Yeah. And we should just, do you want to just mention your book quickly then? Or do, or what else do you have to the say book about you Fire read, Grid? right? Not much except, yeah, Graham read the book. He narrated it. He did an awesome job. This is your book, is what, C5 YouTube. Handbook, right? Yep, Which a is, C5 yeah. Handbook. Yeah. If you just are, are you going to put it on YouTube. Audible? It's on YouTube. 
Oh, I don't know. And all that? No, I didn't do like a, a good enough job for Audible. I mean, I, it was really a rough, rough job. Like I just did one take. Like because I'm gonna make, I'm making that account an ACX account to submit stuff to Audible right away here. Yeah, uh, you could probably patch up a couple spots and yeah. put it on Audible. You probably fine. just do a fresh read. <laughs> Well, I don't know. How long, long was that? Was, like was it six long? or seven hours? Oh, no. tough. Yeah, yeah. Tough After read. fucking Song of the Immortal Beloved, nothing seems long. I wonder how long Concerto is. Or Concerto. I don't know. Hopefully it's not at 20 hours. No. That's a fucking marathon. Uh, so we got a couple CAC spots opened up. Well, no, I got this weird thing going on where I got some people bugging me for CAC spots. This is Contact at the Cabin? Contact at the Cabin. In April? April. Uh, April 16th to 19th, 2020, was sold out. And then we had a couple people drop out, give their spots up. So technically right now I have a two of the entry-level common area pullouts at 450 which is a fucking screaming deal. I mean, for the weekend. 450 bucks for three nights accommodation, all your meals and your transportation to and from Vegas is too cheap. I don't know what I was thinking, but there's two of those spots left. Get them while you can. And yeah, then, that's, that's also uh, transportation to the sky watching, right? That's, that's everything. in the vans and all yep. we're driving to everything. Uh, we pick Bryce you up in Canyon Vegas and, and you don't worry about a thing until we drop you back off at the airport. Yeah. Bryce and Zion. With a nice little gift. Hikes and sky watching. And oh, yeah. Matheson has, uh, Dave's got a fucking fantastic thing. Uh, itinerary. Itinerary done. I talked to Brandon Powell yesterday. He's fine with everything. He said three hours a day is a ton of time to get through 50 people. Um, he had a little shopping list for me, a couple of kiddie pools and a bunch of ice. I might have to call ahead on the ice. I don't know. It's a pretty small town, but we'll figure that out. I mean, I figure it's still pretty wintry. We might be able to go up in the mountain, get some ice. We need to. Anyway, so I got we a should use mountain ice. Yeah, that's I got idea. a six twenty five and a four fifty left, and uh, but a couple of people called me this morning looking for a private room, so I might have to work something out for them. Anyway, email me. Don't do anything on the website. It all says sold out. Anyway, so just email me, Darren at Grammarica dot com. I'll get you in there. Take a look Monday or Tuesday by January seventh. The next event will be launched. Contact at the cabin September twenty first to twenty sixth. 2020, two events next year. Of course, that second event is with the mighty Randall Carlson. Uh, six or yeah, six days, five nights, six days, five and a five nights, six days. It's noon to noon, and it's at Soap Lake Resort in Washington. We've wheeled it that that all together now, so we'll be in some nice cabins and stuff there. They'll be catering the whole event. Uh, breakfast. That'll be for five. Boxes. That'll be for five day trips to different areas. Yeah. Uh, of this Washington Scablands. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to be a fantastic time. I'm just working on the, who else we're going to get to come? Cause I think we'll bring along someone else just to sort of sweeten the ticket. But, uh, there's only 25 spots for that 25 spots. That's it. Actually, we're down to 20 cause there's already five people on the waiting list. So if you want to get on the waiting list before January 7th, just email me, Darren at America.com. I'll add you to the list, uh, 20 spots left. I expect that'll sell out probably within the next within the next month or two. I told you guys that the April event was going to sell out fast, and now I've got a bunch of people trying to get into it, and they can't get into it. So we got a couple spots open up. Jump on them quick because they'll probably be gone by. I would say they'll be gone within three or four days of this podcast coming out. Uh, so get that, and that'll be it for next year. But we got some big things on the burner for twenty twenty one. Maybe a castle. Yep. Contact at the castle. Contact at the castle looking like July 2021. Along with a couple other events that year as well. So it's going to be great. Keep an eye contact at thecabin.com for all that stuff. Are you doing a quote this week? No, no. We're good. You want to just make a quote up? Hey, yeah. Can I do a quote yeah. from Shelly? Oh, because yeah. it's my favorite okay, wait, quote. Fantastic. I'm going to play a jingle then. I'm going to be I'm gonna be able to guess who it's from. No problem. <laughs> Profound quote of the week. Darren, can you guess it? It's the profound quote of the week. Can you guess the human who spoke it or wrote it down? 
Thanks, Felix. That was That's beautiful. not Felix. What? That's was not that Felix. You? That's not me, no. Oh. You know what? I'm almost getting good enough to start doing some jingles. Who was that? Uh, Whoa, why do I keep thinking that's Felix? Sorry about that. I can tell that. you right now, it was. He doesn't say if I. Uh, but Will. That was Will. Will, okay. Will S. Thanks, Will S. Yep. Ready? I got my banjo, so maybe I'll make some banjo jingles. Oh, I don't I hate the banjo. And the I was going to bring it in. Like, oh, oh, it just creeps me out. Really? I'm going to yeah. bring it in totally. We're going to bring it in for the next show then. Yeah. Do some live banjo on air. Okay, here's the quote. If we do not unite in our similarities, we will surely dissolve in our differences. Nice. That's very good. Yeah, that's very appropriate. Shelly? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. That's a good one. It is a good one. And I just learned recently that the surely, I had always missed that because I've got that quote all over my books and websites and blah, blah, blah. And she said, you're missing the surely part. That's a Newfoundland thing. Surely. You will surely dissolve in your differences. Who's Shirley? Don't know. That's a Newfoundland thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> Shirley's a Newfoundland thing? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I never heard of that before. Really? Yeah. You've never heard Shirley? Shirley. Shirley. Well, Shirley. I've heard Shirley, Shirley but I didn't Shirley. realize it was Newfoundland. Really? Oh, okay. Speak. That is a bias. There's no such thing as Newfoundland speak. That's very, we're all the same. Is as well an Alberta thing? No, it's A. You as well. Like when you say, have a good night, you as well. I don't say that. I say you too. I know, but everybody in Alberta says. I also say where well. you too, which I picked up from my new friends. And that's wrong. That's that drives me nuts. What do you prefer? Where you're at? Yeah, oh. two is not. The, it's where you it's used backwards, right? Did, say it again. Where are you two? Where are you two? Where are you at? Yeah. Where are you going? Where are you going? Or where are you at? Where are you two? It could mean a few different things. It could be where are you? It could be where are you in relation to what we need to get done? Like, hey, you done the show notes? Where are you two? Okay, cool. I like Have it. Have you heard that? Never heard it. See, there you go. Never heard it. She never heard Shirley either. So, <laughs> well, I heard Shirley. I just didn't know it was like colloquial oh. to Newfoundland. Oh, all right. It was Shelley. Yes, I guessed it. He guessed it. Well done. Support the show. Grammarica.ca slash support. We got a whole new decade here. We got big things to do. We want to go contact at Castle. We want to get to doing more and more events. We got uh, the Vision Quest at the Commune coming up on the Spring Equinox, March 21st. It'll be, uh, it's going to be a quite a packed little thing too. So if you want to get in on that, let us know. Actually, best thing to do for all that should is join the chats, grammarica.ca slash chats. There's a channel for the Commune. There's a channel for Contact at the Cabin. That's the way you're going to stay the most up to date on anything is to be in the chats, honestly. Uh, support grammarica.ca slash support. We need, uh, support's been down over Christmas. I get it. It's Christmas. It's the holiday season. Now we got a brand new year, brand new decade. Good time to clear that conscience. Throw a little value <coughs> back at the Grammarica system. Email me too. Stories and Send synchros. And stories and synchros and all exciting. that fun stuff. And, uh, yeah. Graham at grammarica.com. Graham at grammarica.com. Um, boost your karma over at grammarica.ca slash support. Be kind to one another and enjoy this chat with the one and only Rick Strassman. Happy to say we've got Rick Strassman, MD, back uh, in Grand America. It's been like five years, I think. <clears throat> He's the uh, author of DMT, The Spirit Molecule. That's the uh, the famous uh, book and movie that everybody has, has seen. And uh, 
We've talked about Rick a few times since Darren's DMT experience. And he's also written a couple other books. And he's, uh, you know, really great researcher and uh, on DMT and psychedelics. I mean, your, your it bio took five is... five years. Your hey, bio, that's crazy. Because yeah. I was yeah. thinking about... I was already... You know, strongly into the idea of doing DMT when we had him on the show. Yeah, yeah. And it took me five yeah, years hesita- to jump off Hesitating for five years. Yeah, but uh, your bio is huge, Rick. I don't want to get into all the detail there, but uh, just, you know, thanks for coming back on and chatting with us again, giving us a little update. Well, sure. Uh, thanks for the invitation again. Well, you know, Darren, I'm interested in your DMT experience. If, uh, you know, that wouldn't, you know, if, if you know, that would be all right to at least, you know, begin with. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because... I think uh, Darren likes telling it and people have been complimenting him on his uh, honesty and his uh, forthrightness of telling how his ego was devolved in that or dissolved in that experience. Hey, Darren. Yeah. Well, I think it came back a little. <laughs> oh, did it? <laughs> well, I must have, because when I did it the second time, you know, I kind of got that. Oh, message. you got a little bit of a You know what it was? Face, the second time, I think it was more that I thought I was ready for the DMT. I think that's what it was. Is the second time I went in, I, I think I had a cockiness to me because I had done it already once, and there was someone else there had that had never done it before. So it was just kind of one of those things that yeah. Well, you got a cockiness to you in general, Naturally. anyway. So, yeah, exactly. You know, so maybe it's time that DMT showed you that. So do you? <laughs> um, well, you know, Terrence McKenna used to say that one's hand always shakes lighting the pipe. <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good way of, of describing it. Cause it's like, uh, well, the first time I had the first hoot and it was, it was almost, you know, I had that immediate sort of surge of fear. And I, I mean, it's amazing how quickly it comes on. Like there's no way to really be ready for that. So when you're like <clears throat> just still holding in the first hoot and my vision was sort of starting to break down and getting the, like, lines coming off of everything in the room and then when i blew that out like by the time i went in to have the second tooth the pipe was like glowing these crazy colors and you know reality was starting to like a hyper visualize i guess and like with crazy colors and almost some neons and everything was like it was it was turning because at that time i could still really i was still in the realm in reality or whatever this place is and but it was all becoming like hyper vivid and like almost psychedelic, I guess, for lack of a better term. Like I was in this weird sort of Star Wars cantina space bar. And by the time I blew out the second hoot, I couldn't see much. Like at, I'm by that time, I'm already kind of losing perception of where I am and when I am. And I had to like. So this was on like a Saturday, probably at like eight o'clock at night. And I had to, I had to pick up my kids the next day at like 11 AM or something like that. But as soon as like, as soon as I blew out that second hoot, all my time concept like disappeared. And all of a sudden, like I had this overwhelming sense of fear about my kids and I started asking if my kids were safe and stuff like that. And my buddy Jake assured me that, you know, everything was, was hunky, hunky dory and that, uh, I had smoked some DMT and, and that kind of sent me back. You know, there's interestingly enough, there was some stuff that maybe my, uh, preckle up my, or my cognition about my kids might've been something oh. else coming through. Oh, okay. But anyway, um, well, that could be, you know, um, one of my volunteers was a mother of a young child and, uh, you know, she was more reluctant to use DMT, uh, after the kid was born than beforehand. Cause she felt all that responsibility. Yeah. 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 So, and especially the first time. And I mean, it all starts breaking down so fast that you really don't know what's happening. Like there's, it's like you're, 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 you're seizing to be. Or you're, you know, Darren's disappearing at such a quick rate, I think, you know, and that's when I had the like overwhelming sense of fear come over me, like super, super scary. Like to the, like, I still think it's probably the most scared I've ever been in my life for that, for that, for that bit of time there. I don't know how long it was because my concept of time was kind of already gone and that. Yeah. So how did you manage that fear? 
I just had to let, kind of let go. It was like I was trying to maintain myself or my control or I don't know what it was, but I equate it to just letting go. And it was like once I sort of surrendered to the experience, all the fear sort of started transitioning into, well, first it was kind of into an astonishment because I went into this like space where everything was sort of black around me, but there was this sort of psychedelic school bus going downwards to the left, but it wasn't really a school bus because it was like infinitely long. It was more like a slot machine sort of, and all the slots were turning around, but it looked like a school bus and all the slots had these. Now at the time I thought there were entities, but on my second trip, I clearly seen a bunch of symbols. And now on my first trip, it has me questioning my first trip on whether I've seen entities on those twirling slot machine things or whether they were the same symbology that I was seeing on the second trip. But Yeah, I think either way, they're both symbolic. Yeah, so I've seen them, but I didn't even, at that time, I couldn't even tell you who was seeing them because, like, I for a while there, I had no concept of Darren or myself or that I was anything observing anything. And then I sort of slipped into this other state where I was getting flashes of all these faces of people, you, you know, but yeah, well, I think. don't, I don't even remember seeing the faces, but it's just like something that when I yeah. think back, I remember seeing certain faces, some from my past, some from my future, some I knew, some I didn't. But in that moment, I couldn't have told you whose faces were whose, because I didn't know how they related to me or who they were. I just knew that I knew them, I guess, or that I had memory of them or whatever. I, I like it, it gets it, hard it, to explain. It happens really fast too. So you're not really prepared. Yeah. Especially the first time. Well, actually both times, but, and then after that, I had like crazy feelings, like overwhelming feelings of joy and some love. And then, I mean, I almost burst into tears a couple of times and I, you know, I wasn't sad or I don't know why, you know, I just, it was just that sort of feeling of elation and uh, yeah, it's like, it's like overflowing with emotion. Yeah, exactly. And I had a pillow I was hugging and I had my blanket there and, it, and then it was sort of like, I mean, and for me, it was more like an hour yeah, experience. Like, Cause it was like, pow, I went in, the whole like in and out thing is like, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. But then it was like, you know, I didn't get up from that spot. I was sitting for a good 45 minutes after I came back into knowing who I was. And, you know, I was still sort of fragmented and I was kind of integrating and like, I don't know if I could have walked around if I would have stood up. Yeah. Were you working with your breathing as you were coming down or even when you went into it with that anxiety? Because breathing can really be helpful and grounding if uh, you can remember and you're able to. Nah, no, I probably wasn't. I probably wasn't. But I mean, that now that whole process of coming back together was, was, I mean, it was, I don't even know how to explain it. It was just sort of, it was like I was absorbing lessons that I didn't remember taking or, you know, I still to this day figure that first time was like, you know, being busted apart into a million pieces and put back together with a bunch of shit that was clogging up that, you know, whether it was previous notions or beliefs or hangups, part of me was gone the next day and it's never come back. Uh, what part? Just, uh, some, res a lot. I, you know, I don't know how to explain it. Like maybe some built up resentment or some things I hadn't dealt with. I had, just gone through uh, some things in my personal life that I was kind of hung up on. And it was just like, all of that seemed to dissipate or something. dissipate. It seemed meaningless. It just seemed like uh trivial. Yeah. So it was a po It was a positive thing. Like positive. what you left behind was, yeah. was yeah. stuff that was dragging you down or holding you back. Or... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, so Graham, do you notice anything different? In yeah. The, yeah, in definitely. There? Yeah. He was, I mean, the next few days, I mean, he was, <clears throat> He was definitely different. I mean, he was, there was less resentment. You could tell he was kind of, yeah, just at a new sort of stage, you know, and he's, I think he's maintained that for the most part. It's been a couple months now, has it, Darren? Or? It's been two months. Yeah, yeah two, two months and, and yeah, he, yeah. 
Well, do you think you're less depressed because there's a lot of new studies showing that psychedelics, even one shot, one dose, wow. is uh, something that can help with depression? You, well, you know, I've never really been a depressed guy, but if I was ever going to be in that state, you know, I was probably closer to that this July, August, September than I have been. Yeah. And uh, it had kind of timed up with that. And it was actually like every part of my being was like, when my buddy was like, hey, let's get into that DMT tonight. And like every part of me screamed, nope, bad timing, bad idea, can't do it. But I just finished reading a book that kind of told me to ignore that voice in my head. <laughs> so I just jumped on it. And I mean. But you'd also been doing a lot of work before that. Doing, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on the path of trying to do a lot of inner work and trying to be a better person. And I mean, it, it just seemed, I feel like it pushed me ahead a long ways in my work for sure. It yeah, seems like well, it's a lot. It seems like it's a lot easier for me to let stuff go. Let maybe. stuff go, or not be attached to outcome or myself. Yeah, you accomplished stuff and understood stuff that you maybe just kind of hoped was there, or got got some hint was there. But then, uh, with the DMT experience, it made it real, more solid, uh, more more truthful. Mm. And the strange thing is it's like you can't put your finger on why or what happened. Like, I don't know what happened, but the, I had come out with these strange things. It's like you, like you say, something happened in there, but it happened so fast that I have no real way of processing it. Yeah, and the process might be unconscious. I mean, it may just not be something you can access, uh, you know, the actual mechanism of how it works. But uh, you can you see the effect. Uh, you feel the effect. So then the second time, so then I waited, I think like five weeks, six weeks, six maybe? weeks before I went back in and I had actually a, f a f friend of mine, a fellow I know that, that was dealing with some depression and he had, uh, once he found out that I had done it, he, uh, he quickly cornered me and mentioned it and he was like, you know, I've been wanting to try that for a while. So, um, we waited about a month or so and then we went again and I, I was like, well, you know, if, if you're, if, if I'm going to take him, me and my other buddy, Jay, were like, I oh, will do it too. So, uh, he went and you know what the interesting thing with him, I'm not going to mention his name or anything here because I don't think he'd appreciate that. But this guy, I'm telling you from the, from the guy looked like a different human being. From the time he showed up and we went out for dinner and everything beforehand. So I spent two hours with him face to face beforehand. And then he does his experience, has a profound experience. And when the, he's leaving, I even mentioned to him, I was like, dude, you look like a different person than you did when you showed up here today. And you know, what's interesting. So I show up, uh, I show up, um, uh, about two weeks later, I show up, uh, someplace where he's supposed to be and uh, he's out for lunch, but, uh, his buddy's there. And I'm like, Hey, where's uh blah. And he's like, Oh, he's just out for lunch. He'll be back in about 15 minutes. I'm like, okay, uh, I'll be back. And he's like, man, he's like, uh, or no. So, th so then he comes back and I ask him, I'm like, buddy, the other guy left. And I was like, so how you been? He's like, great. He's like, you never guess. He's like, I came in here Monday and buddy says, you look different. Wow. You look fucking lighter. Wow. And that's exactly what <clears throat> I had perceived is he looked like he had had a load off. And then, then he mentioned the same thing. He's like, that's, that's how I feel. I feel lighter. So, but it was just interesting to see like two people noticed a physical change in his face. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, yeah, there must've been a release of some tension maybe in his face. That's the muscles. Yeah, that's what I think. And then, so anyway, that was when I went in and I, I think I had a bit of a cockiness because like, whew, for the second time I felt like it all happened a whole lot faster. I don't know if maybe I, I smoked more or if I sucked in faster or, but it seemed to happen like way faster. And I didn't know, I suddenly just came to the space where I didn't know what was going on or where I was. And I think I just like muttered out, I'm okay, right? And, and Jay again was like, yep, you're okay. You're at my house. You smoke some DMT. And it's always nice to hear that. You know, that's a good thing. 
to hear that you smoke some DMT because that gives me some concept of what the fuck is happening while I'm panicking. Right. Um, uh, yeah, you really need to have somebody around that's, you know, preferably straight and uh, experienced and can support you in any way you need, which can be, you know, substantial requirement for support. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've been with people before that I was holding their hand where they're like, hold my fucking hand, man, yeah. tighter. Um, so I, and I had that and I'm like, you're like, you're okay. And then the, that's where the experience did kind of help. Cause I just sort of fell into it after that. But then I seen, uh, the, I don't know if it's, it seems like, this, I mean, it looks similar to the pe pictures people draw the jester or whatever that they see. And he was like, for like a split second or whatever, he was right in front of me looking right at me. And he distinctly said a word two times. And I've never been able to, like, I don't even think it's a word that exists in our reality. Like, it did, I didn't recognize it. I, like, in that moment, I recognized that this is a word that. You didn't get a feeling from it at all? No, no not, nothing. He said it twice. And for well, some reason, I keep going back to Jumanji, but that wasn't it. Mm -hmm. I'm really, I've, the kids, have, we've been playing a lot of Jumanji. Um, but it was just this word. And he said it very clearly twice. And then he was gone. And then I went kind of tumbling into this and it's at the time I equated it to like a black and white book, which is interesting because I'm looking at this table right now. Um, but it was like, I was going into the pages, like into the fold of the middle of the book where the book pages come up together, kind of right into the spine at the bottom where all the pages are curling in together. And I kind of went, it was like I was going in towards that, but it just kind of kept like infinitely coming in, kind of like that vortex thing that Randy Powell was on. So it was like this book was just spinning in, into itself. And then it started looking like a film reel, kind of. And it had all these crazy symbols on it that I don't, I've never seen before. I couldn't tell you what they were. And then from yeah, that. Did you write them down? No, I couldn't. I couldn't. By the time I came back out of it, I just, I've lost it. I've lost, like, it's even like that dude and that word. And I just, I'm like, it's like literally three or four minutes later. And I can't, I can't, it's just nowhere there for me to grasp. You know, there's a group in London that's working on a continuous infusion of DMT where it just drip, drip, drips into your vein and you could stay in that state for much longer. So I think that's going to be a really valuable way to uh, prolong and investigate the DMT state more carefully. And you can interact with those things better and you can remember and you can write stuff down when you come down and then go back in and in and out uh, for a few hours. I think it'll be a really great way to uh, get a better you know, sense of what that DMT space is really like. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I guess once you get well, in there. Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, the study has not yet begun, but uh, they're taking names of people that would like to volunteer. Oh, really? Can you email me that? Yeah. I'll throw my name in the hat. Uh, sure. Yeah, it's, it's at an Imperial College, and it's Christopher Timmerman is the lead investigator, T-I-M-M-E-R-M-A-N. And that's yeah, in London, so England? It might start next year, hopefully. That's awesome. That's great. Oh, that sounds crazy. So that's a, that was the next thing I was going to ask you. So have you noticed in, in, uh, is it like, so is like, is there a difference between, because I've got a buddy who's, who got some, uh, lab made, uh, some lab made, lab made DMT and he was, so it's like water soluble or whatever he said. And uh -huh. he was injecting it into his muscle and getting a, a different sort of experience. And then I've all, he's also made the tea, made the brew with the bark and the inhibitor. He takes the inhibitor and he makes a brew with the tea and he, he takes like a, an ayahuasca like experience. And then in yeah. your, your studies, you were doing the, the transfusion directly into the bloodstream, correct? Uh, yeah, but our first volunteer, like the very first person who got any DMT in our study, we gave it intramuscularly too. Uh, because the majority of the previous studies gave it that way. Uh, but this volunteer um, had smoked DMT previously, and um, I was interested in uh, what the smoked effect was like. So when the intramuscular effect seemed a lot slower than the smoked effect and the peak wasn't as great, uh, we then decided to switch over to giving it intravenously. 
Yeah, that's kind of what he mentioned too. He said it was way more blissful. It was fully blissful the whole time, but he said it was like, yeah, it was a much slower come on. It didn't come up as high and the whole thing sort of happened a lot slower. Yeah, it comes on maybe, gosh, I'm trying to remember, three minutes, maybe two, three minutes, as opposed to when you smoke or inject it, it comes on within just a few heartbeats. Wow. So what's the, um, any, is there any difference in those two experiences between smoking and injecting? Well, if it goes into the muscle, it takes longer to absorb and uh, hangs around longer. You know, the quality is you know, similar, but it's just more intense and rapid uh, with the intravenous. So is Darren's story pretty similar to a lot of the other stories? What's that? Dar- Darren's experience, is it similar to a lot of uh, oh, other people's? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it you know, sounds like the full-on DMT effect. Yeah, and a lot of people come out with similar... <clears throat> Uh, improvements in a way or like there's just with with um, <clears throat> healthier attitudes or it sounded like you know you were saying that there's also this uh, <clears throat> somewhat evidence that maybe even psychedelics help with depression even a one-time dose so that's becoming common well you know it depends on what you go into it looking for what your intention is and your state of it's, mind at the time <clears throat> you know so in, in our volunteers, we screened people real carefully uh, and weren't you know, treating anyone. It was just a psychopharmacology study. It wasn't yeah. a therapeutic study. You know, so the volunteers were, were you know, pretty healthy uh, you know, psychologically and you know, physically. Um, I, I, I mean, well, you know, everybody's you know, got their issues uh, and uh, has got you know, ongoing conflicts. Yeah, so I would say that most people got some insights into um, into issues that were taking place in their life at the time. Yeah, you know, but because you know nobody was using drugs, nobody was depressed. You know, you know nobody was uh, having post traumatic stress disorder. Um, it was what is called a you know, ceiling effect. Uh, you know, because they were pretty healthy in the first place, there wasn't much room for them to improve more. Right. You know, but if you are depressed or you're anxious or you're struggling with a life issue that you can't otherwise um, resolve, and you're and and you're working on it in the meantime, either in therapy or self reflection or introspection or spiritual study, um, you know, if you're gearing up to improve your life, uh, then uh, a big psychedelic trip can uh, can speed that process along substantially. Mm. What do you think, because uh, I've got some uh, some people I know that are trying to get there with, with, with something a little milder, like some psilocybin mushrooms, and it, they just seem to keep getting a bad, bad really? experience every time. Yeah. Is that, do you think there's something with putting too much hope into it or overthinking it or? Um, well, uh, are the mushrooms good? Yes, I can attest to the quality of the mushrooms. Okay, yeah, because uh, you know, first thing is know your source. Uh, you, you know, so if uh, mushrooms are otherwise uh, good, uh, potent, and effective, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I mean they aren't panaceas. You know, psychedelics. You need to uh, you you need to have you know, something for them to work on. Um, you, you know, so you have your mind, your personality, your health, uh, your psychology. You know, so you need to get you know those in as good a you know, shape as you can before uh, expecting the uh, intensification of that kind of work under the influence of a psychedelic. Uh, you know, if if <clears throat> you're confused and you're drinking and smoking and uh, out of work and having, uh, you know, relationship you know, problems, you know, it's unlikely a big psychedelic trip is going to really turn you around. Um, it could, but it could be bad too. So oh, that's you want to, you want to steer yourself, uh, you know, before you get started with the drug experience to, uh, make certain the effects are as good as they can be. Oh, that's really interesting. The set and setting comes to mind 
mind space as well, head space, mindset. But it's even more than that. I mean, he, I think what he's saying is you got to be on that path <clears throat> that you want to be on prior, you know. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, so they just work on you. You know, they don't contain, you know, something, you know, miraculous intrinsically. You know, they're not like antidepressants. Uh uh, they you know, catalyze what's already there. They speed up certain you know, processes which are already uh, underway. Right. Oh, like actually, I wanted to I wanted to ask you about in in an addiction sense. Um, a study, I guess, studies with with uh, you know healing from addiction or or uh, not necessarily with DMT, but maybe maybe specifically with DMT. I, a friend of a friend of a friend had a problem with. Um, so I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but it was, uh, <clears throat> they had a relapse and they almost overdosed on, uh, or they did. Can you no, over, can you, fentanyl. yeah, fentanyl. Can you overdose without passing away? Is that still called an overdose? Yes. So they overdosed yeah. on, they overdosed yeah. on fentanyl. I think once or twice after they had had quite a few years of, of, uh, sobriety. And then they got into, uh. Uh, what's his name's work in Vancouver there, the hungry, we're all of a hungry ghost, Gabra Mate stuff. And they, they, they tried ayahuasca or DMT. I can't remember which one. And he ended up, uh, I think he ended up, his whole life changed and he ended up, you know, sort of like downtown East side. And I don't know the details of what happened, but his partner at the time was kind of blaming the, the psychedelic experience, because I think he went down this path of like wanting to, I, I don't know if he was wanting to help others through this experience or if he just ended up relapsing majorly in the downtown East side. So it's not really fair, but I feel like the relapse was what, um, and the OD was what would have taken him down that path. Not really the DMT experience. Like, do you have any negative, uh, experience with healing from addiction? From DMT or, or or setting people back into that? Uh, what do you mean? If somebody uh, takes a psychedelic, do they then you know, relapse yeah, into yeah. the problem they yeah. had before? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could develop psychosis, schizophrenia, after a big psychedelic trip. Uh, if you're vulnerable, if you're prone to that disorder, if you're kind of close to the edge anyway. Yeah. You know, so... You know, that's the idea that the you know, psychedelics aren't inherently beneficial. You know, they just are, they, they're the you know, catalysts or amplifiers uh, of what's already going on. So, you know, your friend may have just drunk ayahuasca out of desperation, but was kind of on the way, you know, downhill anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, uh, and he may not have wanted to stop using, too. Uh, he just may have wanted to... Uh, go, you know, deeper into understanding, you know, the addiction, you know, not necessarily to stop, but, uh, you know, maybe for other reasons. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, a lot of people, uh, are traumatized by a big you know, psychedelic experience. If they're not ready, it's, you know, like any other huge event, like an earthquake or, you know, getting married or going to college or, you know, being in combat or, yeah, it's 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 a you know it's a really big thing you know so if you aren't prepared uh, if you don't have support uh, it can be traumatic and uh, you know trigger all kinds of problems. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of people that are benefiting through addiction on like doing ayahuasca and and even other psychedelics, you know, and and it helps them recover from addiction. I think there's more evidence evidence of that, but I think people still need to be careful. And I mean, there's a big. I think there's a discussion in the, in the, you know, recovery community at least, or some people consider it a, you know, a relapse or some people stay away from the psychedelic. So I guess it just depends on where you're at. I mean, I don't have a opinion on it either way, really. I think it's to each his own as far as that goes. You- um, yeah. And the studies which have been demonstrating, uh, you know, benefit in addictions with, you know, psilocybin are, uh, you know, part of a big, you know, uh, well, like a specific course of treatment. Um, right. You get, you, you begin with, you know, 12 hours of, you know, psychotherapy. Right. Uh, you, you know, before you get the psilocybin. Um, and you've got, 
experienced you know, professional sitters in the room with you when you are tripping, and uh, there's quite a bit of uh, you know post you know, session follow up to make certain that you're both okay and you're integrating the insights that you got from the drug trip. That's a good point. Yeah. Have you looked into any of the the stuff lately with uh, psychedelics and autoimmune diseases? Uh, no, no. Uh, I don't, yeah, I mean, I've heard about it, but I don't think I've read any papers. There might be one that I glanced at from Dave Nichols' son, Chuck Nichols, who gave, you know, DOI, which is like, uh, What's that like? It's like mescaline, and uh, it enhances it enhanced immune you know, function in the test tube. I don't, I'm not sure if there were live animal studies. Hmm. What have you heard? I was listening to, it was actually Gabriel Mate again. I was listening to a talk from his. I've got it. My buddy Dave Matheson sent it to me. <clears throat> I could dig it. Actually, Dave Matheson did a blog on it, and he had the link in his thing. So, And uh, I listened to, it's an audio lecture. And uh, Gabe was talking about, now I can't remember the condition, but this woman had some sort of an autoimmune skin condition where her skin just sort of wanted to keep hardening. And she treated it. Oh, uh, yeah, scleroderma. Yeah, and she was treating it with cortisone cream. And I guess basically the, 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 the gist of it was that, you know, she this cortisone shit would work for so long and then it wouldn't work and she would die. And that's kind of the prognosis of the disease. That's how it goes. Um, and she was kind of at the end of it and she had, you know, she was not working. I guess she was typing like 120 words a minute or something at her day job. And she had got to the point where she was not working. She was actually bedridden. Uh, so she can't even walk and she made arrangements to go to the, to the Amazon or something of the sort some place to do a, an ayahuasca thing with some shamans anyway. And the reason she did it was to go c uh, come to terms with her own death. So she went there because she had heard somewhere that this was a good way to approach her death. She was having trouble with her death. So she wanted to go try this ayahuasca journey to get some closure on her life. And what happened instead was she came back and she had started, she had regained the ability to walk and she was back to typing 60 words a minute. And... Gaber is equating it to that um, cortisone and adrenaline are both things uh, released by stress in the body. So he was equating it to that, that anything that can be treated with cortisone could possibly be some sort of post-traumatic stress marker. And that was, uh, I mean, that's my sort of limited understanding of it was that this woman sort of went, she had the psychedelic experience to come to terms with her death and instead, she had a reduction in her symptoms. Yeah, well, in a case like that, I think the psychedelic and uh, uh, you know circumstances of you know taking it in a you know, shamanic setting, you know, those things activated her, um, her own innate healing mechanism. Um, you know, the actual way in which that might take place is pretty complex it's immune and stress related and uh you know perhaps some microbiome in the gut you know but it's uh, uh you know mobilization of one's own innate healing mechanisms um which can be uh, uh which which you know, can occur i think in a you know properly prepared for and uh you know supervised uh, you know psychedelic uh, you know drug session um it's uh you know, if you you know, look at it you know, from like a you know, clinical point of view, it's almost like a placebo, uh, and you know, placebos have real you know, biological effect. Uh, they're understanding more and you know, more you know, the immune you know, correlates of the placebo response, and you know, could be that endorphins are involved, and uh, yeah, you know, they're just starting to you know, crack the biology of the placebo response. You know, but I think if a uh, you know, drug is able to stimulate your own healing mechanisms, uh, you know, that could be referred to as a placebo, you know, because there's your biological uh, you know, correlates which are actually producing 
uh, you know, beneficial biological types of effects on the illness. So it'd be that same premise of amplifying, but you're just amplifying your own innate placebo ability. Yeah, it's some mind, uh, you know, it's, you know, uh, it's, you know, some kind of, you know, harmonization of the mind and the body that, uh, you know, wasn't in effect before it appears to be. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the meta, like if there's a metaphysical aspect to this at all. And I know, <clears throat> I know it's um, good to look at it from a clinical and scientific way, but that's now, then you mentioned the placebo, which I always thought of placebo as you had to be aware of it. Like you had to, you know, know that you're taking something. But I guess that would make sense if you're taking, you know, ayahuasca, then maybe that's what you yeah, know. Yeah, if you take ayahuasca, yeah, you yeah. know you've taken yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it doesn't, right. it doesn't mean, yeah. Well, you know, um, and, you know, because of the intensity of the effect, the, you know, the ecstasy and the visions and, uh, you know, the realization of, you know, this and that, uh, you know, I think, you know, those are the correlates of the placebo response being activated or those kinds of, you know, feelings are, you know, necessary for the placebo effect to kick in. Uh, so, uh that's my thinking about these you know, drugs nowadays because, uh, you know, a couple of weeks go by and there's a new indication for using psychedelics, for, you know, uh, for tobacco addiction, alcoholism, eating disorders, uh, let's see, you know, for OCD, post-traumatic stress, you know, nature appreciation helps your meditation. Yeah, yeah it's just crazy. Uh you know, so it's like a panacea, and if a panacea, you know, uh, is is effective, I think panaceas work through the placebo uh, response. So I think you know, psychedelics are you know, super placebos uh, in a way uh, because they only work on what's there. They work on your mind and your body, and you know, seem to make a, uh, a connection uh, behind the scenes uh, in order to. Well, in order to heal, but I think also, uh, you know, they can reinforce, you know, bad ideas uh, uh, at the same time. You know, so that's the importance of, uh, you know, gearing up to get, you know, better. Uh, you know, like this woman who went to the Amazon to get ready to die. You know, she was opening up. I mean, you know, she was, uh, you know, ready for the next step. You know, she was letting go. And, uh the experience helped uh, in a way that she hadn't quite expected, b b you know. But you know that experience, you know, couldn't uh, you know be as effective without her letting go. Uh, just an amplification of that process. Yeah, and then obviously it works on your subconscious too. Like when you said it, it, it works on stuff that's there. There's also a there that's in the back, like in the background, and it's pulling either fears or pulling either potential or something out of your subconscious. I feel like. You know. Yeah, yeah, you know, well, that, uh, so that is a really good point, is the issue of the unconscious or the you know, subconscious. You know, uh, um, all because you experience or understand or believe you know, something which you know, seems completely new or that it came out of the blue, I, I think it's, you know, more the case, you know, that those ideas were there behind the scenes, mm -hmm. you just weren't aware of. Yeah. And the, the you know, psychedelic, uh, you know, shown a light uh, on those you know, previously hidden uh, beliefs or feelings or experiences. I like how Terrence McKenna said it was just like, after you have that second hoot, a bunch of little elves come in, knock down the door with their tools and just, you know, come marching into your subconscious and get to work. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, they do. Uh, you know, the intermediaries, the you know, metaphysical you know, ways uh, in which that you know, process uh, begins. Um, yeah, well, it uh, you know, points to the importance of these you know, drugs and understanding the mind as, in a way that uh, I think is otherwise impossible. Is there any other new studies at all that, um, you know, we, just before we started recording, I think you, you and Darren were mentioning a study that, uh, about, um, was it the pineal gland or about DM, uh, endogenous DMT, DMT or something like that? Uh, 
Yeah, well, toward the end of my DMT book, The Spirit Molecule, <laughs> or, well, you know, toward the end, but also, uh, you know, kind of I introduce it previously uh, in the book, is the whole idea of the pineal gland making DMT. Uh, and I, you know, marshal a you know, lot of um, you know, biological studies which, which support that idea. You know, so a research group in Ann Arbor uh, started to look for DMT in the pineal and you know, published a paper in 2013 you know, demonstrating uh, you know, DMT in the pineal gland. Um, so you know, they can, you know, they've you know, continued their work on naturally occurring DMT um, in the rodent and in you know, human brain too. Uh, and uh, just a few months ago, uh, it published a paper that, number one, you know, demonstrated DMT in the rodent brain. And uh, it also, uh, number two, you know, demonstrated you know, that the enzymes and the genes required for DMT you know, synthesis occur uh, in the same you know, brain region. Huh. You know, which uh, would support the idea that, that the DMT in the brain is produced locally. Um, and they concluded that their first paper about DMT in the pineal was incorrect or, you know, was an artifact of the probe going through the brain on the way to the pineal and snagging some brain DMT uh, as opposed to it, uh, you know, lodging or you know, being in the pineal gland itself. Oh wow! You know, so in this new, in this new study, they didn't find DMT in the pineal, but they did find it in uh, the rodent brain, and you know the same enzyme localization occurs in the human brain as well. You know, uh, and there were a, a couple other very interesting uh, findings in that paper. Um, one is that concentrations of DMT in rodent brain are pretty close to those which are found for neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin. You know, so that uh, points to the possible existence of a DMT neurotransmitter system, which would be a very interesting you know, finding. Wow. Um, and you know, finally, they uh, put a number of rodents into cardiac arrest, and, uh, you know, they died. Uh, and the concentrations of DMT in the brain increased quite a bit. Uh, which you know, supports a role for endogenous DMT elevation in uh, NDEs? the state of consciousness yeah. occurring when you're dying. Yeah, so, that's funny because I've been explaining it as like getting shot in the face because it feels very similar to death. Well, how do you know that? Do well, you know I that? don't know that. Yeah. I guess, but I equate it to that for yeah. some reason. <clears throat> well, you know, one of the you know, theories in the DMT book is that is, I mean, is that elevated you know, levels of DMT occur uh, as we're dying, and that the elevated DMT mediates the visions and the voices and you know the out of body sensations that occur um, as you're dying. Uh, you know, so a couple of people have written me you know that have undergone a real NDE, like in a you know, car crash or. You know, cardiac arrest, uh, and then you know a couple of years later they've smoked DMT, <clears throat> and uh, you know sometimes the experiences are quite uh, comparable; they're quite you know, similar. <clears throat> you know, but other times they're extremely different. So you know the jury is still out. You know there was a the paper came out of that same group at Imperial uh, at Imperial College, Chris Timmerman. Um, yeah, so he gave a number of DMT smokers a questionnaire that uh, was intended you know, to measure the near-death experience. And he compared the scores of those people that had used you know, DMT uh, on that you know, uh, particular questionnaire with uh, scores for people that have uh, undergone a real NDE. And you know, there was a uh, you know, pretty strong overlap, which uh, you know, supported you know, the idea of endogenous DMT being involved somehow in the NDE. So is the argue is the is the confusion just where the DMT is made in the body? 
uh, in terms of what? Like, like with, with them trying to prove that it's in the pineal yeah, gland? Yeah, I was just like going to ask more the about DMTs, that. DMTs, they're finding brain DMT. Does that mean like they're, they'll, you know, they're fully, we're fully aware that the DMT is there. We're just not sure where it's getting made. Well, it's you made uh, you know, quite a bit in uh, the visual cortex, which is an interesting finding, isn't it? Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, you know, so it well, you know, the enzymes and the genes required for you know, DMT synthesis also occur in the retina. You know, so there's a you know key you know roles you know somehow for you know, DMT in uh, the visual experience. Yeah. So do yeah, you think it's that like you need DMT to observe well, to reality? See. Uh, had to see well with eyes closed or with eyes open. You know that's the yeah. really strange thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. And especially if it's the pineal. I mean, when you start tying that into that, this other weird thing that we've been calling a third eye for a couple thousand years might be making DMT too. Well, you know, the latest evidence is it isn't making DMT. It might, but I would say at this point, it's you know, pointing towards the brain rather than the pineal. Yeah, you know, which I'm glad uh, because everybody's got a brain, you know. But you know, not everybody has a pineal. You know, there are uh, you know people with you know, uh, a, you know pineal stroke or a, you know, like a you know, tumor which has destroyed the pineal, and they're you know pretty normal. You know, they dream and you know they're not unusual in any way. You know, so it's it's I think I'm a lot more. You know, valuable to know that DMT is made in the brain because you know then we can start to you know, look you know more carefully at you know, where in the brain is it made um, and um, you know what's it doing there. <laughs> yeah. It makes me wonder if monks that are able to do you know like because you know you always hear that DMT is like the shortcut to something that you can get to naturally and is it where you get enough control over your 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 nervous system or your subconscious functions that you can make yourself release extra DMT. Well, you know, your meditation I think can be helpful, but um, you know, you give DMT, it's reliable. It happens pretty much the same way each time. You're just catapulted into this DMT world, and you know, there you are. And not, you know, not many monks or you know, meditators can attain those kinds of states uh, with any regularity. A few people might be able to, but... It takes a while. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, for the rest of us, you know, we're just never going to get there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, psychedelics are a short, you know, you know they're a shortcut, but, uh, you know, they're fraught. I mean, it isn't an easy way to do it, and... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you, you know, the meditation. If if you're into a you know, religion that uh, you know, mainly meditates, like Buddhism, uh, you're being uh, you know kind of steered in a specific direction too. You've got support. You've got scripture. You've got a community around you. You know, so that in a you know way, it might be as important as a big uh, you know trip either on. Uh, uh, I'm either on you know, psychedelics or uh, as a result of meditation. I guess we have to get one of those monks to hit the DMT pipe and tell us what's how it compares. Yeah. Um, well, there was a monk in our study, um, and you know, his response was much you know, less than uh, you know than your average response. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, <laughs> he's just like me. He's already. <laughs> Well, you know, that's what I thought, you know, but I hate to disappoint you because I have a case that disproves that, you know, theory completely. Uh, you know, the other guy in the study or, you know, one other guy in our study had, you know, no effect of a high dose of DMT. Like, you know, we gave him, you know, uh, you know the injection and the flush and he opened his eyes and he said, are you done giving me the drug? Like he had no effect at all. And I thought, well... You know, who is this guy? Uh, and, you know, he's just your average guy. He liked to swim. He was a bartender. He liked playing tennis. He had, you know, never meditated a day in his life. Uh, yeah, you know, so of all the people with a small response, you know, 
you know, to DMT. And so one guy that had, you know, zero response, you know, was about as average a person as uh, you, you know, might imagine. Wow. I know a guy that's going through that with some mushrooms right now. He's like, I ate fucking four grams of mushrooms, nothing happened. No effect. I uh, know it's a very strange thing. Uh, you know, uh, you know, once I was at a party, uh, and you know, uh, you know, people were smoking DMT, um, and this it, um, woman psychiatrist uh, just had no effect from smoking a lot of DMT that was getting everyone else in the room completely, uh, you know, intoxicated. Yeah, you know, so you know, Terrence would you know talk about you know five percent of the people that he gave. Uh, you know, DMT to had very little or, you know, no response. And, uh, you know, we saw three people maybe in our study of, you know, close to 60 volunteers, which is about, you know, 5% too. You know, so it you know, could be, you know, their receptors are, you know, different or they metabolize the you know, drug really quickly uh, or it isn't getting into the brain in the way it might, you know, normally do. Yeah, you know, you know, the phenomenon of you know, psychedelic resistance is you know, very interesting. You know, those people ought to be studied, uh, you know, closely. And, yeah. Uh, you know, their biology, uh, you know, characterized. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if those, let's say DMT, for example, those three people out of 60, if they did mushrooms, if the same thing would happen. Like, I mean, we also know somebody else, Darren, who's tried uh, mescaline, I think, and it, and the same thing. He can't, uh, I never tried he can't get anything out of that either. So I wonder if it's all across the board or if it's just certain types. Or... Yeah, yeah, we don't really know. Uh, yeah, you know, you could, uh, you know, think about, you know, the genetic engineering implications of, you know, something like that. You could, you know, clone the gene that keeps you from responding to psychedelics, uh, you know, for whatever reason. And they're uh, going to start putting that in the vaccines. <laughs> we can't have these people the waking up. We can't have yeah. these enlightened, these uh, enlightened mofos. <laughs> All yeah, right. it could be put in the drinking water so yeah. you know, nobody ever gets off again. Yeah, exactly. <sighs> they probably would, too. So you mentioned the, the Hebrew Bible a bit as well. You wanted to to get into that? Um, well, yeah, the Hebrew Bible, I've been studying quite carefully for over 20 years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, I got interested in it because, uh, you know, the model of you know, prophetic experience in the Hebrew Bible uh, corresponds quite closely to the DMT effect. Uh, so I started to make a study of the you know, prophetic state, you know, compared to the DMT one. You know, the prophetic state in the Hebrew Bible uh, is any spiritual experience. It isn't only foretelling or predicting the future. Um, and uh, if you expand, you know, the definition to include any spiritual experience, um, you know, you know, by any you know, figure in the text, uh, you can start to you know, see some comparisons between it and the uh, uh, effects of DMT, like the first you know, chapter of Ezekiel, is completely psychedelic. There's spheres spinning, there's lightning, there's a blue uh, you know, background, there's ice, there's a roaring sound, there's you know, travel through space, there's abject you know, terror, there's an angel that you know, touches him and speaks to him. Uh, you know, so uh, I was you know, looking for a, you know, a better model to you know, take into account what we found was the, uh, you know, common experience of the, you know, DMT volunteers, which was that it was quite interactive. It was, you know, full of stuff as opposed to being in the white light, you know, the ego dissolving union with God kind of thing. Um, you know, that really wasn't very, uh, well, it, it was completely unusual in our study for people to have that kind of experience. Only one of the volunteers did, a matter of, you know, close to 60 people. You know, so instead it was, uh, there's these beings that you talk with, uh, you go through space, you maintain your own personality, you can interact, you can ask questions, uh, you can observe and take notes, you can communicate perhaps with the beings. You know, so that was completely opposed to the Zen Buddhist Enlightenment kind of model, the unitive white light experience. You know, so in order to uh, kind of, uh, you know, um, well, 
Let's let's backtrack for a moment. You know, so I um, you know came to the you know, DMT study from uh, you know the religious or spiritual point of view of Zen Buddhism, which I had been studying for you know, quite a long time. Mm-hmm. And you know, the goal of that you know practice is the enlightened state, you know, which is you know, free of content and feelings and thinking and personality, uh, you know, personal you know, sense of self. You know, so when that um, wasn't uh, in, in occurring in our study, um, and after I was you know, finished with it, um, I began looking f- you know, for alternative spiritual models to uh, understand the uh, the effects of DMT you know, from a, a spiritual or you know, religious point of view. Uh, you know, so I was raised, you know, Jewish. I had, you know, learned Hebrew once upon a time, uh, and just kind of stumbled, you know, back on to, uh, you know, the you know, paths of studying you know, the Hebrew Bible. I retaught myself, you know, biblical Hebrew and started reading, you know, the classical commentators, uh, which are quite, you know, helpful in in understanding, uh, you know, the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, you know, so I started to compare the DMT state with, you know, the prophetic state. And uh, there's a really great overlap in terms of the uh, you know, phenomenology. You know, the visions are you know, similar, you know, the voices can be similar. Uh, you know, the emotional extremes are, are, quite, uh, uh, are uh, you know, quite similar. You know, but there are, uh, you know, quite important you know, differences at the same time. Um, you know, one of them is the interactions that occur in the prophetic state, as uh, laid down in the Bible, are quite uh, you know, sophisticated. You know, there's a lot of questioning and answering and you know, conversations which take place over an extended period of time, which isn't characteristic of you know, the DMT effect. You know, the other is you know the content of the message uh, of the state uh, in. The you know DMT state you know there aren't a lot of words there isn't um, a lot of um, ideas which are you know, brand new which can be spoken of uh, or you know communicated or you know written down you know but in you know the prophetic experience it's quite verbal uh, Isaiah and Ezekiel and Moses and Abraham you know all of them you know wrote and spoke and taught in words you know so you know those are the two main differences. Um, you know, so uh, I then started to you know look at you know the content of the uh, you know prophetic message, which uh, then you know got me into oh wow the Bible I mean it's this gold mine of information and ideas, inspiration, and also I think you know has great relevance to understanding both specifically uh, you know, the DMT effect but you know psychedelics in general. Um, is it you know, provides a you know Western model for spiritual experience at a very deep level, um, and can help us understand the you know, psychedelic experience, you know, to get more out of it, to you know, prepare better, you know, you know, to learn how to interact with the beings and the intelligences that you might encounter uh, in the state, uh, you know, teach you how to pray. For example, if you're in a really tight spot and you're panicking or just you know really fearful, uh, you can pray as opposed to breathing or or uh, you know letting go. You know, so it can you know help us understand the you know, psychedelic state, and it you know, can help us interact with it in a way that uh, makes it more useful. Hmm. Did they talk? Did you learn how they enter this prophetic state? Is it just through traditional spiritual practices or? Uh, well, you know, that's an interesting, you know, question. You know, most of, you know, the prophets, you know, did not seek prophecy. You know, they, you know, because, you know, prophecy, if it's, you know, true prophecy, uh, you have a lot of responsibility to both you and your community to correct them, uh, to, you know, point out their shortcomings and to do better. You know, so it's an unpleasant, uh, it's, it's an unpleasant. It's a burden. It's a burden in a way. Yeah. It's a big burden, and you know most of you know the prophets complained about you know being prophets. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, you know, so they didn't you know really seek it. You know, so if they weren't you know seeking it, you know, where did it come from? Well, it came from God, at least as understood by the writers of you know the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, yeah. 
maybe they just like I wonder if it was like they were having some tea and there's just that one guy just doesn't is there's naturally inhibited to that ayahuasca experience or something, you know? Like if you have five percent or a percentage of people that don't get messed up from DMT, is there a percentage of people that don't need the inhibitor to get messed up orally from DMT or something? Um well, you know, they've you know been, you know, looking for, you know, mushrooms and you know, cannabis and you know, psychedelic uh, you know, fungus. Oh, excuse me, I need to drink a bit of water here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> well, y- yeah, you know, the question of whether the you know, prophets use you know, psychedelics or not, uh, you know, is an is an interesting uh, question. But I, I just don't think we're ever going to really know. You know. Um, you know, so on the other hand, you know, the existence of endogenous you know, DMT, um, you know, makes, you know, locating an external source, you know, relatively unimportant. Right, um, right. I think we you know, need to understand what, you know, regulates the production of, uh, you know, DMT in the brain. Um, you know, but, you know, f- uh, you know the metaphysics, of the prophetic experience, which were, you know, worked out quite a long time ago, a you know, thousand years ago, you know, 1500 uh, years ago, is, you know, that, you know, God influences the mind of the prophet, you know, from above. There's this, you know, kind of, you know, downward flow. And uh, it stimulates the, you know, the mind of the prophet uh, through the production of, you know, visions and of voices. Um, and it's up you know, to the prophet to extract information from what those you know, visions mean, what the you know, voices are meant to communicate. You, you know, so to the extent that the prophetic visions are comparable or resemble those you know, brought on by DMT, it makes you know, sense to you know, think about you know, DMT as you know, mediating the way in which you know, God communicates with us through yeah. visions. Yeah. Yeah, that's very interesting. And nowadays there's more of a new age, you know, download happening to a lot of people where they have these experiences of oneness or which could probably be considered close to DMT and they're they're getting all kinds of, you know, whether it's automatic writing and spiritual information or formulas. I mean, there's all kinds of different downloads. It sounds very similar to what was happening back back then, which would have been, you know, God. Yeah, well, and I'm not saying, and I'm not saying there wasn't, there isn't, you know, a god, and it's still not happening in that way as well. But. Right. Um, well, the main, you know, message uh, of the you know text, which is a prophetic text, which means it was inspired by contact mm-hmm. with the divine, is you know two notions. You know, one is of one God. There's only one God, and you know, number two is the golden rule. You know, so, you know, those are the two main things that are repeated over and over in the text, is there's one God who deserves our prayer, service, and worship. Um, And the golden rule, which uh, is, you know, the way to behave. Right. You know, so there's, you know, behavior and belief. You know, know, the essence of, you know, I guess, uh, you know, the essence of, you know, belief is just one God. And, you know, the essence of you know, behavior is the golden rule. You love your fellow as yourself. You know, so everything else is, you know, kind of commentary on those, or explication of, uh, you know, window dressing, so to speak, of those two main ideas or, uh, you know, recommendations. Yeah. yeah. So do you want to, do you... Yeah, you know, so, yeah, you know, so you can do automatic writing. You can, you know, learn, uh, you know, but... You know, it all you know boils down to you know, believing the proper things, the true things. You believe what's true, not what's false, and you you do good. You act in a good way yeah. uh, to both help yourself and your fellow. You know, so you know those are the most important things. Um, and uh, yeah, I've you know found in a strange kind of way that uh, you know the answers and the questions and the discussions all you know, return to understanding, uh, you know, the prophetic text, uh, you know, which is the Hebrew Bible. You know, I, I mean, I don't want to sound like a fanatic, but, uh, 
it's, it's you know what I you know, discovered and I like, and it explains a lot of things. And uh, I'm coming from you know both a Eastern you know religious and a you know, psychedelic point of view. So yeah. you know it isn't like a you know careless stumbling into this stuff. It's uh, you know the result of a lot of considered uh, you know thinking about it. Yeah, well, I like how you found also ways to maybe help people in their contemporary DMT experiences by using prayer or breathing that might help you get out of that, uh, you know, that situation, Darren, or like that, you know, that might help you break through or surrender or, um, you know, it, it's interesting if you should maybe try some of that in your next uh, experience, Darren. I will. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, well, well, there's one great line, Jeremiah seventeen fourteen. You know, write that down. Hey. You know, Jeremiah seventeen colon fourteen. Uh, it's you know Jeremiah's prayer. It's like you know two short phrases, and uh, I'll tell you, it can really get you out of some tight spots. <laughs> what are they? Well, you know, I don't like to quote scripture. Okay. Oh, you can if you want, though. Much. I mean, you can hear if you want. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'll just get too much flack. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, you know, seventeen, fourteen. Okay, we'll we'll, 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 get we'll quote, quote, we'll quote, quote it. Yeah. We'll, Graham will quote, quote the scripture in the outro. Yeah, and yeah. The you intro, know, there's yeah. quite a few translations. You know, so go online. You know, look at half a dozen different yeah. translations. Pick and one. Pick the one that you know, feels the best. Right on. And what about uh, you? Got a new novel out too? Came out this year. Joseph Levy escapes death. Um, it's an autobiographical novel. It's about a character who. He you know, suffers some illnesses and recuperates over the space of about a, v- a year in a small southwestern town. Um, yeah, that came out in March. It's you know I you know looked at Amazon the other day. It's you know, categorized as you know, medical humor. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that it's 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 a strange book. It you know all the things that occurred you know to the character occurred you know to me and all of the you know thoughts. Which you know passed you know through the mind of you know the character also passed you know through my mind you know but it's a specific I guess slice of my personality as opposed you know to the whole thing and you know it you know goes into Holocaust discussion the Christian roots of anti-Semitism there's some you know failed relationships there's you know psychedelic insights there's friends. Uh, there's enemies, there's questionable health care, you, know, uh, you know, there's angelic nurses. Yeah, he, uh, you know, so there's, you know, horrible diarrhea. There's one you know, chapter on that. Uh, you know, there's hiking. <laughs> yeah, it just you know, kind of covers all the bases. Uh, it you know, came out in March, uh, one-man press called Regent Press in Berkeley. Um, it's gotten really great recommendations and blurbs, but... Uh, it's hard getting the word out because it's a you know, change in you know, category for me. So it's not you know, quite my readership. Uh, so uh, you know the the you know, people that you know, have read the book like it. So I'm encouraged. It's just uh, a matter of you know, uh, you know getting people to uh, you know to find out about it. We'll spread it as far as we can. I think I'm going to pick up a copy and read it, and I'll yeah, yap great. about it after I read it, too. Yeah, I'm on great. a fiction trend right now. And you know what? I want to get Graham Hancock's fiction, too. I think I'd like to del- start yeah, delving that would into be that. Good At the time, you know, a few years ago, I was just anti-fiction, but I'm coming back around. Yeah, good. Yeah, you know, my book's pretty small, you know, 228 pages. It's uh, you know, a couple-hour read if you really whip through it. Perfect. Awesome. Any movie rights yet? Are you going to play yourself in the movie? Uh, no, no, I'm kind of camera shy, but, uh, you know, I, I think it'd be a you know, pretty fun movie. You know, kind of like Catch-22 in a way, or, you know, Port Needs Complaint or something. Before we let you go, I do have one last question. Do you have any idea how many times the documentary's been viewed at this point? No, no, I don't. Because, I mean, I was looking through a couple of YouTube's account, and it's got to be getting up there. I, oh, mean, yeah, I was looking at $10 million or so just by the couple little accounts I looked at, and it's got to be... Oh, really? $10 million, huh? Wow. It must be interesting for you, because that's been how long now? 10 years, maybe? It came like, out in 2010. So 2010. It's been nine so nine years. years. And I would and I mean, it's more popular now than ever. That's what I mean. And it's really the the whole the whole psychedelic thing, Rogan's the DMT thing, it's ramping up still. million I mean, people, right? Yeah. 
20 yeah. million people a week and he's talking about DMT every other show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I you know, got to hand it to Joe Rogan. <laughs> uh, he's been a really uh, great Hulk publicizer opponent. of the DMT work. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as you like, so like when you start typing DMT into Google or YouTube, it just auto completes the spirit molecule. Yeah. Because I was trying to find other ones because I've seen the spirit molecule like 10 times now. So I was trying to find like, is there any other decent documentaries here I can start wrapping my head around? And there's a lot of like testimonials and stuff like that, but I haven't really found anything that compares. Yeah, it's a great movie. Uh, it was really fun to do, and uh, yeah, it's just getting increasingly popular. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and I mean the, the whole the whole psychedelic movement is still is still you know helping people and it's still gaining lots of traction. So it must be very interesting for you to to see that happen. Uh, it's great. Yeah, I'm really quite happy. Uh, yeah, yeah um, and you know people are just getting more interested in DMT. It's still kind of a niche drug in a way. Uh, but, you know, there are some young, bright people that are studying it, so it's going to stay in the public awareness. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to stay away for a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can just read about it and yeah, start it, reading the Hebrew Bible. You know, if yeah, you have maybe, questions, get back to me. <laughs> that'd, be good, that'd be good timing, actually. Maybe yeah. email me a good translation. <laughs> you know, there's no good translation. Oh. I'm working on one. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, are you really? Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm oh, working on one. Oh, that's great. Uh, I could send you Genesis chapter one. That's perfect. Oh, yeah, perfect. do that. That would be great to, be to read. Yeah. To dabble yeah. into. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it might be a bit of a rough ride, but that's uh, okay. With it. That's okay. It'll be nothing compared to the rough ride I went on a couple weekends ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad. Well, it's actually you know worse in some ways, but uh, you know it's a slow effect. It's, more, it's, it's a lot more manageable. More yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of drip by drip. Well, Rick, uh, an hour and 15 has flown by. We appreciate your time and uh, your expertise on the show again five years later. On the other side of a couple DMT experiences, I appreciate your work more than ever. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, And thanks for having me on your show again. It was a pleasure. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon, Rick. Have a good night. Okay, good. Bye-bye. That was a chat with the one and only Rick Strassman. That was great, man. That was fun. Of course, fun. this one was not live because for that very reason, when I uh, did the pre-interview chat with Rick, he was like, I'd really rather not do live. I'm a little bit camera shy. And I was thinking today, I was like, remember the good old days when we used to just podcast? Oh, man. <laughs> it was nice. Like, did you notice the like, air of relief in yeah. here when I was like, we're not going live? It's yeah, like, like, oh, it's like the yeah. whole room deflates. It's like, oh. It's an added pressure. Yeah, I know we like it but too. It keeps but you it's on just, point. yeah, it keeps you on, on your toes. But it is a it's a different. I can't doodle sure. anymore. That's the problem. I yeah. miss doodling. Yeah, I have That's this good. whole. Maybe... I have a whole collection of the great artwork I made during the show. And you know what? I was reading a thing the other day that said doodling helps you remember. Oh my god, really? Yeah. Does it help you pay attention? But then or? Grimstick was texting me pictures of me doodling. Oh really? From oh, the yeah. YouTube. Oh my god. He was taking really? screenshots, oh. and it just got you know. I was ashamed. Yeah. So. Way to go, Grimsteak. Anyway, yeah, big well, thanks, thanks to Rick, Rick. for yeah, coming on the good. show, getting us up to speed. Do check out his novel. Um, yeah, if you haven't seen The Spirit Molecule, uh, check it out for sure. Did you find the quote? Or the, not the quote, I guess? Uh, no, maybe I'll save it for the uh, intro. The profound scripture reading of the week. No, you didn't find it then? Uh, well, I haven't looked. Oh, okay. I don't want to lie. I haven't found it. Jeremiah 7, heal me, Lord. Oh, that's interesting. Did you hear my stomach grumble just then? <laughs> yeah. Okay, here's the first version I pulled up. Is it 1714? Let me just double I don't check. Know, hurry up. I got the right one. Starving. Yeah, 1714. I thought we have any food here. Ready? Anyway. Heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. For you are the one I praise. Oh, that's a nice, easy little one. Yeah. Perfect. I have that on a little card. There you go. A little DMT panic card. Yeah. In case of emergency, break glass. <laughs> Heal me, Lord. Interesting. Yeah. Well, check out the... Go into your next experience and say that. Yeah, well, you're going to have to remind me, because like I say, I'm a few months away from my next experience. There is some really interesting... Yeah, when we're getting into, like, you know, my... <clears throat> my uh, research into how to deal with demonic entities and, and incubus and succubus and all that. And how 
religious prayer seems to be one of the only things that, that works for a lot of people. I'm telling you, man, we're going to end up religious by the end of the show. That's, that's gonna, <laughs> we're going to go from atheist to fucking something in the end. Yeah. I well, mean, I mean, I've always been something. That was another thing I wanted to ask Rick along the way was if he noticed any of that in his studies. Oh. Growth, growth and spirituality. Or, or, in, or difference between atheists and, and yeah. their experience between an atheist because and Because psychedelics a, definitely played a role in my migration from atheism. Yeah. I mean, it was a bunch of stuff. But psychedelics. Mainly the there. podcast, really. The podcast played a huge role. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of death. And data. Death and data. <laughs> so those are the two things. Those, <laughs> those are the new guarantees. <laughs> death and data. <laughs> Fuck taxes. All right, guys. Uh, Gramerica.ca slash support because the show don't go without the flow of the cash from you guys. We love it. We love you guys that support the show. You help us pay for the rent. To keep us warm. Just on the other side of that wall, it's minus 30. No, it's not. It's minus like minus 20, maybe. You're really or are you talking wind chill? Or? Support here. I know. I'm trying to muster up some support, and you're just. <laughs> he's so fucking set on wind chill. It's minus 38 at the top of the Heinz Tower. Today. Why, does, why does it need to use my Bluetooth? I updated my that phone, and it's just. I don't want to. It's because you have this pod. It feels busy. like minus 21. So, yeah, minus 21. Close enough. Cold enough. And snowing like a. Oh, yeah, there's a blizzard. There's going to be a foot of snow by morning. We, we might have to sleep at the studio tonight. Anyway, gridmerker.ca slash support. Help us get some snacks for the studio. Uh, do all the other stuff in the show notes, too. Review the show. Share the show. Tell your friends about the show. Sign up for the newsletter. All that stuff is fantastic. It helps. And we love you for it. Other than that, thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Just your